Hi, I'm Linnea Quigley. You're going to hear Movie Dumpster. Movie Dumpster. Movie Dumpster. If you don't see it, you're insane. Hey, what's up? Welcome to Movie Dumpster Season 4, Episode 16. Today we're talking about Sorority Babes in the Slime Ball, Bowl-O-Rama, from 1988, directed by David D. Coteau. I'm Joel Escola. I'm Sean O'Rourke. I'm Connor Linnea Quigley's Flat Affect McGraw. <laughs> and I'm Mr. Lobo for reasons that can't be explained. Welcome to the Dumpster. I really need to thank you because I had no other intro prepared, and then you <laughs> handed me one. Good job. <laughs> you just stole that effect straight from him. Oh my god, from the pre-ramble before we started actually recording. Did you improv that? Good job. <laughs> I did. I feel good. I want a cookie. I like cookies. They're delicious. <laughs> so we're back. With This is our second episode for f- our Fallen Empire Month, fellas, and uh, we got a doozy. And not only do we have a doozy of a movie, we have a doozy of a guest. The magical, mystical, magnificent Mr. Lobo. How you doing, Mr. Lobo? You forgot unnecessarily mysterious. Yeah, that's that, that's key. Oh, yes. Excuse me. Can I do that again? Yeah, take it one more time. <laughs> unnecessarily mysterious. Mr. Lobo, yes. Mr. Lobo, yes. Okay, okay, got you. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> We'll fix it in post. <laughs> no, we won't. <laughs> uh, this is Mr. Lobo. Yes, thank you for inviting me. I uh, it's been a long time coming. Uh, I, I I appreciate uh, being on the podcast. The best part about being on a one hour podcast is the two hours of troubleshooting before the podcast starts. <laughs> <laughs> Well, hopefully soon, you know, we'll get back to getting together and and doing that whole thing. But who knows what's going to happen? But yeah, out of the void and into the dumpster. The shadow knows. Yes. (laughs) Uh, Yes. I'm excited because, you know, I I was a little upset that I didn't get to talk about Terror Vision. I'm sorry. That I hope that's the best show of your season. (laughs) (laughs) Because you could have had a horror host. On the Terror Vision episode. This is true. Oh, yeah. We we uh, we had our friend Serge on, and we've been talking to him about this for, like, God, like, year and a half. He, he is obsessed with Terror Vision. It's his favorite movie, and he was just like, oh, please, if you have me on, have me on Terror Vision. We're like, all right, I think we can make that happen. And then he's like, oh, by the way, I'm also doing a cover with my band of your theme song uh, themed with the, uh, Terror Vision. It's like, oh. Okay, perfect. Oh, that sounds great. Actually, I should say that like, I'll say that as Linnea quickly. That sounds great. I hope you had a good time with your friend. We did. (laughs) We did. Good. But we're going to have a good time with our friend today. Yes. As well. Fantastic. So, uh, so Mr. Lubbock, why don't you uh, tell the listeners a little about uh, what you do, who you are? Sure, absolutely. Um, For those of you who are under 35 years old. That's me. (laughs) Me too. Uh, I have a television show that I've been doing for 20 years called Cinema Insomnia. We started on an ABC channel out in California. They had a movie at 3 a.m. that ran 20 minutes short. (laughs) And I was tasked with filling that 20 minutes with something, and I developed the format of the show. Uh, I'm not... A lot of horror, traditional horror hosts usually are dressed as a vampire or a mad scientist or a mad vampire or possibly a, a witch. Uh, I am just in a dark suit um, with uh, what I like to call birth control glasses. <laughs> I have kind of a mm, soul patch and a mustache. Uh, and uh, I have a sidekick that is a houseplant named Miss Mittens. Um, I have a revolving door of companions, including a female robot monster named Romana, uh, a gorilla named Cogorella, um, some, uh, you know, Cosmonauti, who's a sexy space girl, um, a lot of different characters, Rad Abrams, skateboard attorney, (laughs) (laughs) a lot of different characters. And basically the format is that we (laughs) we present the movie in usually 11 segments. And then I wrap around each segment with, uh, you know, some humor when appropriate, 
and um, then we have uh, a lot of vintage material that is sort of um, adjacent or perhaps stream of consciousness with the movie. So a lot of old movie trailers that might be of a similar theme, old vintage toy commercials. Uh, and we do interviews with celebrities. You know, we've had uh, Sid Haig and um, Elvira and Bruce Campbell and on and on on the show. It's so amazing. And um, I've also been in some feature, you know, horror fan. We've been doing this for 20 years. Horror fans grow up to be horror filmmakers. So I've been cast in a bunch of horror documentaries and horror films. I, I was Criswell in the in the 2016 Plan 9 remake. Um, which was available in Walmarts everywhere. <laughs> that was the premiered at Walmart, the first film to premiere at Walmart. Oh, I think I remember that. Yeah, the line was out the door. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 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 And um, the, the, the prices fell that same day. <laughs> that was the amazing thing. The smiley face with the cowboy hat, right? Yeah. 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 Right off the shelf into the bargain bin. <laughs> it, it went to that. It went to 574 by four o'clock the same <laughs> afternoon. <laughs> Uh, anyhow, went right, went, fell right into the, into the bins. But anyhow, so we did, we, we did that. Um, I have a Blu-ray that just came out called Mr. Lobo Does. The classic cinema insomnia episodes are all on, on alpha video DVD. We have 22 episodes, including our newest one, which is a film that we like to call American Werewolf in the Philippines. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God! How have we not watched that? <laughs> Which is our edit of uh, Beast of Yellow Night. There you go. And uh, and then uh, and I, I and I think that that's I get that'll get you pretty far. That's probably close enough. I do a lot of live events. Uh, uh, yeah, this Friday we're doing a pop-up drive-in thing at the Vintage Cafe in Paradise, Pennsylvania. Oh, that is so cool! Yeah, you guys just started doing that. Yeah, yeah, we've done we've we've done it a couple of times, and uh, you know it's nice. You just you know you park your car outside. We have the FM transmitter, and um, you know we give out a raffle prizes, and you know we're we're still building it up, but it's 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 a lot of fun, and you know I I mean and not to turn it on a downer, but you know I was thinking you know something close to home in case events and things dry up for whatever reason. Sure, uh, I can just sort of do a, a movie show at the local cafe. Yeah, that's great. Where is that located again? That is uh, 3373 uh, Lincoln Highway East. And that's Paradise, Pennsylvania. Uh, the Cackleberry uh, Antique Mall. And there's a, just a vintage cafe. They've got a big parking lot. And uh, we, uh, on like I said, fr- Fridays, whenever I'm not, I'm not booked at a convention or something, we've just been doing uh, film shows there. That's great. Love doing live film shows. Yeah, that is so cool. Well, we caught you at the Mahoning when you interviewed the Kyoto Brothers, too. Um, and you were putting together a special? Yes, we put together a special called Creatures. Uh, should have been Creatures, Critters, and Kyotos. That would have been a better title. <laughs> That's a good one. But we did Creatures, Critters, and Hobgoblins. And so we showed the film Hobgoblins with um, a wraparound at the Mahoning Drive-In Theater. And it was right at that point when the solar company was trying to buy the land out from under them and shut them down. Yeah. So uh, it actually was really great that we were able to put that episode out because it shows you everything at the drive-in from the front sign to the snack bar to the projection room how the films are spliced together to the people in the parking lot and the vendors and all of that and so it was nice to be able to present that and then then of course we interviewed the kyotos at the intermission about all of their work in films like uh you know Wee's big adventure and of course the critter films and uh their work on killer clowns from outer space and so on and so on and uh, so we, we did it. So if the, the episode had a really nice overview of the Kyoto's career with lots of clips, a uh, really nice overview of the uh, drive in. But when we shot it, we shot it generic and we rushed it out um, and we were under the misapprehension that we could use the film Hobgoblins in the episode. So the episode actually got pulled. Right, right. And then um, my (laughs) Rick Sloan is my friend on Facebook. (laughs) (laughs) So the so the director's like, uh, uh, Mr. Lobo, uh, you know, I love your show and everything, but maybe you should have asked me first before putting my movie (laughs) in your show. (laughs) 
Oh, no. And I'm thinking like 20 years of doing this show and I make this kind of bonehead mistake now? Uh, now? So was he cool about it? What happened? Uh, he was very cool. We, we talked about it very rationally and he made me a sweetheart deal to license uh, his films, including Hobgoblins. So I have a year contract to license Hobgoblins for uh, and another one of his films. See, this really messed him up, me putting that thing out, because he has he currently has a contract uh, with Rift Tracks because they're doing a Fathom Events August 17th. Uh, they're doing or did, depending on when people hear this, a Fathom Events uh, where live in theaters with Hobgoblins. And so um, when that's over, it falls back to us and then we'll have uh, Hobgoblins for the next uh, year. To, to use on Cinema Insomnia. So that's... That is amazing. That is so cool. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, it was it was, it was was messed up at first and <laughs> scary because it's like, oh man, this what a terrible thing. I actually did a whole public apology. I apologized to the drive-in and to the Kyoto's and to the Creature Feature Weekend, which sponsored me being there. And, you know, and it's just like, you know, it's like I've been doing this for 20 years. I, you know, I, you know, I could count the problems of content as far as uh, unauthorized duplication of content on one hand, like we've had, you know, over across 20 years and hundreds of shows, we rarely ever have an issue where we've, you know, totally screwed someone on, on their film rights. And so I felt really bad. Yeah. And, and it certainly wasn't intentional. No, it wasn't intentional, but it was one of those things where, you know, I was caught up in that whole thing with the Mahoning and I really just wanted people to, to experience the theater and see that, um, while that was happening and draw so, sort of, you know, uh, uh, put the focus on that theater since they were kind of having a bad time at that in that moment and in rushing it out i i uh, did not do my due diligence so uh you know i i was acting under some bad information and uh you know we all learned something but the nice thing is is that there were no lawyers involved it was just mano a mano we just we talked it out uh i you know sent him some money and everything is fine and that was that well that's fantastic it worked out very nicely <laughs> yeah we're excited we're excited <laughs> i cannot wait um you also have a podcast too sleepless nights i do uh we, we just hit our hundredth episode congratulations thank you um it, it, it's basically um, a friend of mine paul sanders who produced mr lobo does and creative continuity and a bunch of other stuff that we collaborate on um he and i do the podcast together and um, we go all over the place. And what I mean all over the place, it, we rarely even have a topic. It's just like sometimes we'll be in the laundromat. Sometimes we'll be in the airport. Um, I mean, we did we did. I think we did three from the airport and two in the laundromat and in the di in, in our diner. We take it with us on the di to the diner. We take it. With, if, we, if we have to do run errands and go to the bank, we'll take the podcast with us to the bank. I love that idea. It doesn't make any sense <laughs> right now. Uh, Paul is in space on the podcast so he is actually <laughs> talking to us from a space pod and then i have a clone duplicate life model decoy of paul that lives under my under my front porch oh i also sometimes do uh podcasts with and uh so yeah it's a lot of theater of the mind kind of weird stuff we kind of take it a bunch of different directions a lot of fell false starts and stops it's just a it's a very experimental and weird podcast every once in a while we settle down and talk about movies or talk shop but most of the time we just mess around that's awesome where, where can everybody find everything like is, is everything under one umbrella or is there multiple places that people need to go to find your stuff i mean you uh, some people go to the patreon for the sleepless nights uh but i mean that's on all the different formats there's not really one place i mean osi 74 oh, i didn't even mention osi 74 but osi 74 is my studio or outer space international rather is my studio and so uh I have a Roku channel and a lot of the stuff is, is on the Roku channel. Um, and which is also on the website, but the podcast is separate and the YouTube videos are separate. So, uh, I just put Mr. Just, just op roll up your window and yell, Mr. Lobo and something will fall out. <laughs> <laughs> 
So I just look at my TV, which is actually now it's a Roku smart TV, and just go, Mr. Lobo, and it should just, you know, work. I hope so. I hope <laughs> it works that way. I don't know. It actually works on Psy Energy, so you just think Mr. Lobo. <laughs> I just think about it, and it, goes, and it just goes, ooh. <laughs> This is like some Patrick shit right here. You look in the mirror and say three times. But you gotta you gotta spin around, yeah. I go in my TV staticky and your face is just breaking through it. <laughs> Mr. Lobo crawls out of your television after seven days after you watch Cinema Insomnia. That's <laughs> uh, low key terrifying, but also uh, kind of in- kind of exciting actually. Um, I did want to make a comment uh, about your uh, choice of attire because I think it's actually. Uh, great that you kind of distinguish yourself from other horror icons like Elvira and stuff like that. You don't dress like a vampire. Because why do that when you can dress like a slightly more nefarious looking version of the Doctor from Doctor Who? (laughs) (laughs) I always think I look like a hotel manager. (laughs) You don't got a sonic screwdriver in there somewhere. But you have all these companions and everything too. You're just like an inverted version of him. It's great. (laughs) Yeah, like like if Doctor Who was an incompetent who just hosted bad movies. (laughs) You got bored with time traveling. (laughs) Yeah. Sign me up. I guess we'll just watch some movies. Here we go. (laughs) Yeah. No more timey-wimey. I'm going to sit here on my butt (laughs) in the TARDIS. I have a lounge in here. I don't know why I use it. Everybody needs a break. Doctor Who, actually, Doctor Who, Rod Serling was an influence. Doctor Who was an influence. Uh, Of course, Bob Wilkins from Creature was my horror host growing up, and he was an influence. But, you know, I love a lot of those guys. And Doctor Who is one of those guys. Mr. Spock is one of those guys. Roy Orbison is kind of one of those guys. <laughs> so it's like a it's like a Roy Orbison, um, uh, Rod Serling mashup. Yeah. Well, the thing is, is that what I what I love about those guys is that they don't worry about fitting in with other people at all. Like there's they're out there. They're outsiders, but they're OK with being outsiders. They're OK with not fitting in. You know, you you never, ever think about Rod Serling taking his kids to soccer practice or (laughs) you don't go and have a beer with Rod Serling. Rod Serling just appears there. You know what I mean? When he needs to. While you're having a beer to narrate what's about to happen to you. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) And it's going to be terrible, whatever it is. (laughs) You just look at, just steer clear of him. He thinks it's going to be a regular night of drinking. But yeah, so I always I always kind of liked those iconoclasts, you know. Like a character that is not relatable, you know, and doesn't care that they're not relatable. Sure. And somehow that's relatable. (laughs) (laughs) It's an excellent show. And uh, Dumpster Dwellers, if you have not checked out Cinema Insomnia, please do that. There's a whole category on the um, Roku channel OSI 74 for the Cinema Insomnia episodes. Uh, There's 45 Cinema Insomnia episodes on YouTube right now. Okay. Um, you know, I mean, basically it's, it's, if it's free and clear most places, there's a, I think there's 95 episodes on the, on the OSI 74 website. You know, I mean, we, 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 there's no paywall most in most places where it's at. We want to get this content to you wherever you're hiding. Gotcha. And you have a great Facebook group as well. Do you not? I love it. Yeah. It's uh Mr. Lobo's cinema insomnia fans group. It is the only thing I, that's worth doing on Facebook. It's great. So if you're on Facebook, which I'm sure most of you are, go jump in there and uh, and hang out. Hang out in the pool. The water is fine. Yeah, it's it's quite enjoyable. Uh, I, I dragged I dragged Arlen in there, and he's he's also uh, vouched for the fact that it's a very fun place to be because like <laughs> I, every every post I see is unlike the one before it. I'm like, man, this place is great. <laughs> <laughs> There's such a great mix of folks in there. I mean, obviously referring to Arlen Haro from the Phantom Zone, just to clarify. <laughs> yes, yes, of course. <laughs> who? I don't know who that is. Yeah, in case you haven't heard the Wraith or Green Lantern episodes, uh, if you haven't, by the way, go back and uh, check those out. <laughs> well, well, Mr. Lobo, we're super happy to have you, and we ca- I cannot wait to talk about sorority babes in the slime ball bowl rama It's going to be delicious. Now, here's the thing, fellas. Um... So we're doing Fallen Empire, right? So Empire Pictures International, um, their catalog of films, or choice cuts, if you will. Now, this isn't technically an Empire Pictures movie, but it is at the same time. It's that weird Charlie Band, I'm taking money out of here and here and putting it into this kind of thing, you know? Mm -hmm. So Charlie Band has... um, You know him well. You call him Charlie Band. You know... (laughs) Charles P. Band. No. I listen to the Charlie Band. (laughs) (laughs) The devil went down to Georgia. He was looking for a soul to steal. (laughs) 
<laughs> he was looking for a deal to steal. Yes. Mm-hmm. He was looking for a very dark bowling alley. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get to that. Very dark. So he has Empire Pictures, but he they seem. They, I guess he took money out of Empire and put it into Urban Classics, which was a subsidiary of that. This deal's getting worse all the time. <laughs> and then, you know, he gets with uh, David D. Coteau and, uh, and, you know, funds his movie, uh, Sorority Babes, in the slime ball bowl of rum. I might have to say it every time, or can I refer to it here hitherto as uh, Sorority Babes? Uh, no, you have to say the whole thing every time. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, honestly, just saying it as Sorority Babes, if someone who's, is to get lost in this conversation, they're going to find themselves going, wait, what the fuck are they talking about? Because, uh, you know, I, I hate all that stuff. I, I hate when people, people say BTTF for Back to the Future. <laughs> How hard is it to say Back to the Future? Wait, what? I have never heard that before in my life. Life. BTTF for Back to the Future or uh, R uh, O T L D for Return of the Living Dead. I can't it just just say it. They're all short words. Just say it. The TCM. Yeah. I was ready to agree with Joe and just say Swirty Babes the entire time, but I'm feeling called out now. <laughs> So this gets a brief. Uh, so this gets a brief uh, theatrical release, and then it gets put right to video in 1988. There was a theatrical release. There was a theatrical theatrical release. I would assume it must have snuck in and out of town. Oh yeah. You know what happened? It came out in January 1988, and then I was born, and it shit the bed. <laughs> <laughs> you did it. It, the, it bombed because Sean was born. Yeah. Sorry, Hal Havens. <laughs> oh man. It's all right. He got he got some more work. Yeah. He he, uh, he turned into a wipe. <laughs> <laughs> so this also gets aired on like USA Up All Night, which is probably where I saw it for the first time. Hosted by Rhonda Shear, another contemporary movie host. Yeah, and then they popped it out um, in the in the uh, in the nineties uh, on Cult Video, which was a subsidiary of Full Moon as well. So you know Charlie's always got these other, or excuse me, Charles Band has always <laughs> always has these. Uh, sub companies and stuff yeah i bought it on cult video at a at a big lots really Mm -hmm. wow i have the i don't have this one on vhs um i just never came across it on vhs i have the the cult video dvd yeah i have a dvd also i do i do not have a vhs i always assumed it would be one of those big box vhs's though if it did have a vhs release well that's the thing It, it wasn't released like from lightning video when it wasn't released under vestron or paramount or anything like that um, not even like cinema home video. I don't think it was released under cinema home video, which was David D. Coteau's, um, short lived, uh, 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 company. Mm-hmm. I know there was a few that were released under that, like beasties and some other ones. Um, and I think, uh, murder weapon was under there too, I think, but yeah, the cult video VHS comes out. And that's about it for the for that. So the cult, the, yeah. So it came out on because it, it it kind of smacks. I mean, obviously everything that was shot in that time period is basically shot for home video. Sure. I mean, this movie does not have a very cinematic approach to how it's shot. It looks like it's shot for the small screen. But you would think it would at that point, right? Because we're because again, well, it comes out in eighty eight, but we're right in the pocket of the height of Empire Pictures, you know. Yeah. So with its ties to it, I mean, it's listed in the catalog. But it never really gets released as that. Like even the even the bumper in the beginning says Urban Classics, not Empire Pictures. Okay. Um, which is which is pretty interesting to me. Um, I guess like Charlie was like, yeah, well, here's the idea, here's the poster, what have you. And then when he got the product back, he was like, um, we're gonna put it on Urban Classics. How does that sound? We'll do that instead. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows what the deal is with that, but. I just want to I want to talk a little bit about uh, the effects in this. The imp itself, the the, the imp that's uh, running around this bowling alley later, uh, Craig Canton, Uncle Impy, yeah, oh, Uncle Impy. Uh, we're gonna get to him. You mean the Elfin Hooten? The yeah, the Elfin Hooten. <laughs> Feed me, sorority babes. Oh my God, you're not kidding. <laughs> so Craig Canton does the effects on this thing, um, and he this is like I, one of his first movies. I'm pretty sure. Excuse me. He works on Predator before this. Then he does this film, and then he goes on to work under. Uh, he does Sweet Home, which is a Japanese flick, which we definitely need to cover next year. But he ends up working under Stan Winston, and he does uh, Leviathan and Terminator Two, uh, Jurassic Park. All of this while Stan Winston's on top of him. Yeah, right underneath him. Wow. That's incredible. He's pretty talented, this guy. Yeah, make that ear look a little bit more realistic. <laughs> it's awfully rude of Stan Winston, though. Yeah. 
I was going to say, though, uh, you said he worked on Predator before this, and I'm just like, all right, uh, I did the spine uh, connected to the skull in Predator, and now I'm doing, oh, wait, you want me to just, like, make that head look fake? Uh, okay. It probably. I mean, it, it's... So did he make the imp and, like, the severed heads and stuff? Is that... So he did all the uh, all the latex practical effects in this? Is that what you're saying? Yep. All the practical effects. I see. The amp looks really cool. I think he looks pretty good, considering. I mean, considering that's probably like, you know, 80 bucks worth of latex or something. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> well, well, here's the thing. It's not as, as silly and uh, uh, um, non-articulate as it may look. It's still super complex to make. So, like, that imp head sure. comes back in a big way because I was signed up for the Stan Winston School, like, on the online special effects course. So I'm I'm going through these tutorials, and one of them is Craig Catton on, and he's making uh, cable animatronics and uh, fabrication and doing like underskulls and stuff, and he uses the imp head as his example. So he takes you through the whole process of the sculpt and the casting and how to take uh, the negative uh, mold and make a underskull out of it and how to rig it for uh, cable uh, animatronics. It's pretty impressive and awesome yeah and, and also they probably remind you to just barely light it <laughs> <laughs> keep it in to almost totally in the dark shoot it from the neck up and don't light it don't you dare light it here do me a favor we're going to show this damn imp like 17 times and just ADI everything he says uh to to correspond to the scene what do you say <laughs> <laughs> we'll just we'll just bob it up and down <laughs> you just shake it a little bit there you go yeah it just looks like a little finger puppet sometimes it's just it's so stationary gonna make all your your wishes come true, baby. <laughs> oh, come on, Goofy. Get over here. Oh, boy. Oh, I don't know why I sound like this at all. It makes no sense, <laughs> but we're, we're just going to roll with it. <sighs> I feel like this imp knows Munchie. It has to. <laughs> yeah, it knows Munchie for sure. They're going clubbing. They're going to that fucking robot jocks bar and hanging out. Yeah, one one is definitely one is definitely the other's wingman. Well, and I think there's a again there's a, a th just like with Little Shop of Horrors, there's a sort of this throwback to the the 80s was really fond of the 50s in a big way. Yeah, and so teenagers from in 80s movies are really like teenagers from 50s movies somehow, but yet they can't afford to do like a period movie, so they always have a reason why something happened back in the 50s, <laughs> and so we're dealing. <laughs> Dealing with this thing in the 80s now that's sort of related to this thing that happened way back in the 50s because they can't set it in the 50s. But like Little Shop of Horrors, which is a very expensive movie with a, a giant monster that makes nerds wishes come true. <laughs> it, it, with that movie, there he is doing an impression of uh, it is Levi Stubbs from the Four Tops. Who is who is a late 50s, 60s, early 60s musician doing an impression of Screamin' Jay Hawkins, who was a 50s musician. Oh, yeah. I put a spell on you. Yeah. So it's 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 a definitely there's a 50s affect there with that kind of, um, you know, like a 50s, how a 50s performer might sound yeah sure it definitely definitely uh screaming jay hawkins for sure i i was trying to put my finger on it and you nailed it <laughs> all right so we we're talking about we're, we're now but you know are we are, but we're we have all this imp talk now and we've kind of like i feel like we put the imp before the horse look we put the imp before the horse but you know what he's the star of this movie let's let's face it guys <laughs> you think the imp is the star i it it sure as hell ain't Linnea, I'll tell you that. Well, I mean, if you want to be technical, Linnea Quigley is, but... <laughs> it's Calvin! Calvin? <laughs> we spend the most time with, with him and Linnea. St st stun silence. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it definitely starts and ends with, uh, which I, I just call him nerd number one, but yeah. Sure. Yeah. Because uh, he's the one with, the, I guess, the most pure... Uh, he's the most pure of heart of these three assholes, basically. Yeah, he's like the he's the straight man. You've got the got the one nerd who kind of looks like Jefferson Jefferson with glasses, and then you've got the other nerd who's just the obligatory fat kid. <laughs> Hal Havens. I thought he was the guy who gets shot in the head in Starship Troopers in the uh, the training area. Oh no, not really. But no, that's not Hal Havens. <laughs> no. I was just making a quick comparison. Oh, <laughs> I mean, I'm making gross generalizations also. But so, but we start with him, and he's watching TV, and 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 I love how these movies foreshadow because he kind of likes these sort of rough horror shows, which kind of foreshadows the fact that he might be into Linnea's character. Sure, you know because that's the you know. Uh, that's the kind of stuff he likes. You know, he likes the rough stuff. Sure. 
Well, that's that. That makes me think of too. Uh, just real quick, a chopping mall. Like it doesn't open like that, but when they all get together and they're you know having their date night, they have, like the two nerdy characters are just sitting there watching horror movies, and they end up being like the final two in the movie. Yeah, so, but we started on him watching TV, which is which is interesting, I think, because this is always like how you tell a, a cheap movie versus an expensive movie, especially in the in the seventies or eighties. In in a, in a uh, going to throwing it off subject for just a second. Movies with real hot air balloons are cheap. <laughs> Movies with fake hot air balloons are expensive. <laughs> Wizard of Oz is an expensive movie. Around the world or around the world in 80 days is an expensive movie. Police Academy 4 is a cheap movie. <laughs> <laughs> so if you apply this to television, if there's a real TV, if we're looking at a real television, it's a cheap movie. <laughs> if we're looking at a composited screen where it looks like it we're watching television, but really it's two uh, elements that have been uh, optically composited together to make it look like there's a television on in the room. That's expensive. So, so here we're watching an actual TV, which usually, if it's not already made black and white just so that it it reads better it looks black and white because most of those colors won't resolve when when filmed and then you have the whole problem of it not quite synchronizing with the shutter speed and so you're, you're getting all this weird interference from what's happening on the screen yeah but you can still tell that it's slumber party massacre <laughs> you can still tell that it's slumber party massacre which is now is that a fred olin ray um no that is directed by a woman, I forget her name, uh, but that's a Cor- that's a Corman joint. That's right, that's right. But he, he didn't have anything to do. That's surprising. He didn't have anything to do with that one or this one. He might have. You know, we were talking before we got rolling, and um, everybody's everybody kind of knows each other in this low budget kind of uh, web of uh, of people. Whether you know, they probably all went to school together, right? Yeah, uh, you know, Charles Band's at the top of this food chain but then like you have fred olin ray and then you have david d coteau um but they're all they're also all coming kind of coming off of the corman stuff you know what i mean i mean he's still putting out a lot of stuff but he's mostly producing at this point right i think uh i think his last film was frankenstein unbound oh god <laughs> yeah john hurt he's he's somewhere out there in the ether listening <laughs> wow that's a very misunderstood movie uh yeah. <laughs> We talk about it a lot on this show, Mr. Lobo, by the way. I cannot get away from it, dude. That is a defining movie for us for mysterious reasons. Uh, but yeah, that was that was a movie that really stapled the show's identity for some, for some reason. I saw that in the theater. Oh, oh my geez. God. <laughs> oh, my God. Really? I bought it on DVD. I saw it on the Sci-Fi channel, but I, like I said in the episode we did it, I caught the last half hour of it and was just like, what the fuck is this? What is Raul <laughs> Julia doing sleepwalking his way by John Hurt? And what is this thing next to them? Yeah. Oh, man. What I think is really funny is how these movies, again, this is sorority babes in the slimeball bolorama. But I feel like these these guys all went to film school. They all read like Joseph Campbell's Hero's <laughs> Journey or whatever. It's just like, you know, there's so much like character development and establishing who these guys are, even in like the little things that they do for no reason, because no one really cares. No, not at all. You don't need to have the guys, the guy who has the wish to have the other girl uh, be a sex maniac for him looking at a dirty magazine. <laughs> right, right, right. You don't need to have the fat guy be materialistic and gluttonous. You don't need to have the guy who's sort of into the scary girl watching scary movies. You know what I mean? But like they, they're, they're, they're going out of their way to sort of establish who these guys are in that first scene when really there's no need to. They're just a bunch of nerds who want to look at girls topless. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the thing. Like, it's called Sorority Babes in the Slimeball Bolorama. Now, when I hear that title, I think, like, okay, they're what? They're going to be in some kind of, like, st- like I don't know, a uh, 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 Mad Max-esque uh, bowling tournament or something? You know what I mean? Like, f- like bowling against mutants or some shit? Oh, man, that's a much better movie. I want to see that movie. <laughs> I always, like, when I heard it, I thought of something more extravagant, I guess is the word I would use. 
or at least something more like eventful, I guess. And then I get it. I'm like, we're just in a mall. This is how we sell tickets, right? Exactly. It's like, I don't know if you guys ever rent. I, I don't know if you've ever rented Let's Stuff Stephanie into the incinerator. Yes. No, I, no, I haven't. Actually, I think I bought that from you. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, that's a situation where you're selling it as hard as you possibly can. And, this, and and when I hear it, like, I like your idea of of a Mad Max-esque type uh, battle royale in a bowling alley with a bunch of sexy girls in a dystopian future where there's still sororities <laughs> and bowling. Well, that's what they're called, right? Yeah, but I like that. I like that. I, I sort of thought that that might be there might be some kind of tournament or something, you know, or maybe um, they're, you know, it, they're doing some kind of pledge or something. And, and there you got a bunch of sexy girls all competing against each other in a in a in a in some sort of bowling tournament. And then monsters happen somehow. Right. Right. That's kind of what I thought or just based on the on the part slime ball, which we find is just the three fucking co-eds uh that we just talked about really uh but i'm thinking like all right slime ball so there's gonna be slime monsters oh no just jerky guys yeah it's about 0.5 percent of what you just described is exactly what the movie is uh a, a, a sorority pledge or something happens and uh, they, they end up having to steal a trophy from a dark closed bowling alley that's also connected to a mall and inside the bowling trophy is an imp who grants wishes uh but they're the nefarious kind right and somehow the sorority babes have act yeah and somehow the sorority babes have access to this bowling alley for reasons unknown and then they're watching from the security cameras for reasons unknown they're not actually bowling and the sorority sisters that are pledging aren't t technically sorority sisters yet no they're not sorority sisters yet yeah you're right the sorority sister, the sorority babes are the bad guys, really. Yeah, yeah. Sure, by the end of the film, for sure. Yeah. The, I, the, the title could be a case of someone walking up to someone going like, hey, man, like we're almost done. Like, What do you got for a title? He's like, sorority babes in the slime ball <laughs> bowl. Ro there you go. <laughs> that's what happened. Charles, that's what happened. Charles Band was like, here's the title. There you go. Make a movie. And then and then we got this. Exactly. There you go. I'm done. Punching out. And and that's that's it, too, is sometimes the poster and the title come first. And then they have to just with the budget that they have, try to make that come over. Oh, yeah. And, 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 knowing, and knowing most for, film students, they probably had one script that they kept refining over and over and over again. And that was that same script. And instead of a haunted house, they made it a bowling alley. And yes. instead of a, you know, Fabergé egg, they made it a trophy. And, you know, they probably <laughs> like just had this standard script that they would have done no matter what was green lighted. Yeah. I mean, some of this sounds like it was written on the spot. Instead of a lamp, they used a boom box. Or they use a bowling trophy, maybe? I don't know. Yeah, it's possible. Where does the imp come out of, Charles? Um, fucking, uh, he looks behind him. Uh, bowl, bowling trophy. There you go. <laughs> ding, ding, ding. Yeah, let's, uh, let's talk about some of these characters, right? So you said, we, we, kept, we kept talking about these three pukes in the beginning. You have, the, you have, uh, Hal Havens playing the big guy, the big drunk guy, the gluttonous guy. Uh, we all know him from, as Stooge, from Night of the Demons, guys. Yeah. Welcome back to the MDU, Hal. <laughs> and then I think one other name is Chad. He's the dorky guy watching the TV. That's Calvin. Oh, Calvin. Is the other guy Chad? I think it's Chad. Keith, isn't it Keith? Keith, it might be Keith. Jefferson Jefferson is Keith, maybe. Yeah, it's Keith. It's definitely Keith. You know, these these names I'm gonna forget in a week. Who could care? <laughs> yeah, these two guys in the glasses I could not tell apart. So when they kept cutting back and forth, I was like, is that the same person from different angles? Well, they're nerds, right? And every every 80s nerd has the same high water pants, yeah. <laughs> the same socks, the same button up shirt, the, the, you know, shirt buttoned up all the way to the neck, glasses, of course, as I'm describing how I'm dressed right now, but that's beside the point. <laughs> <laughs> Shirt buttoned all the way up to the neck, the the birth control glasses, the high, the the dumps, the, the you know this the white socks, <laughs> all of those things, all the stereotypes, and and so what I love is that that their first plan is to just watch these ladies, to just spy on these ladies in the window while they're getting spanked, yeah, for their initiation, <laughs> right? <laughs> like this is innocent fun, first of all, uh, and again informed by the fifties, right? Happy Days, uh, Porkies. You got a bunch of ne'er-do-well teenagers, teen sex comedy. 
Um, but but they're acting like fifty again. They're acting like fifties kids. You know what I mean? I, I can imagine all these all these nerds trying to all get in the same phone booth together. You right? know, I've never thought of it that way, and you're absolutely right. No, that that does kind of like it. Kind of sounds like a rever- bleh, reverberation through like slasher films I've watched. Where I'm like, this is in the eighties, but all the guys are dressed like greasers. Yeah. And act like them, too. Like, Well, it's also that thing, too, you got to remember, uh, you know, trends come back. Just like, you know, the 90s were back and the 80s were back. So I'm sure in the 80s, the 50s were back. In the 80s, the 50s were back. 80s were back. They're they're still back. Yeah, but people, and just like people romanticize the 80s now. Now, I was a teenager. I was the age of these kids when this came out. I, I graduated in 1988. Well, technically graduated. But, you know, that that is something that is uh, I don't know who these kids are like. They don't resemble my friends. I don't go. Oh, yeah, this is how my life is. I you know, there was you know, I remember just seeing teenagers in movies going. This doesn't really reflect what my real life is like, you know. Um, But again, you know, I. Oh, it's such an interesting perspective because, like, I never think about that kind of thing because, like. As a, I was born in 87, so growing up, I looked at these movies and I was like, oh, that's how teenagers act, right? Yeah, of course. Yeah, well, I, I mean, it didn't resemble my it didn't resemble my life at all. Right. <laughs> Which I thought was kind of funny. <laughs> I lived it, I know. <laughs> yeah, it's bullshit. It's all, it's all fake. Now, I do feel like we did our share of breaking into places we didn't belong, and we did our share of, uh, you know... Peeping? Covering up things that we didn't want our parents to... Uh, find out about maybe a little peeping not a whole lot of peeping you know i think about it like you know i, I kind of had like the low slung video camera and i may have got a few shots that i'm not proud of <laughs> i was gonna say did you sneak into a house and start like looking through the fucking uh door to look at a woman naked in the shower yeah yeah did you just go on full and do a beanie like yeah that's the thing i don't understand is how when they get caught and they don't they go from just looking in the window to literally breaking and entering entering and watching them shower (laughs) and they're like if if that door wasn't there i'd be surprised if they weren't cranking their hogs blowing loads on the wall (laughs) and then when they were (laughs) and then when they were caught they're like we're not rapists (laughs) we just broke into your house to watch you undress that was the next step don't be so uptight yeah <laughs> like what, what what were they doing up there and the reaction somehow isn't i'm gonna beat you to death and or call the cops they're just like oh you ruffians well no they did well i guess the idea is that they were they had some plan for them that they were going to do something awful to all of them but that plan never materialized so we don't really see what the sorority babes were planning on how they were planning on scaring them or foiling them not unless they planted the imp there somehow I, no <laughs> All according to plan. I mean, were they just going to call the cops? Like, but I mean, you know, they di- which they obviously didn't. Yeah, that's what they should have done. Is they should have <laughs> got them to break into that place and then called the cops and got them arrested. That would have been the best thing to have happen, and that would have been actually a great ending for that movie. Is they finally get out of the bullorama and they get arrested. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they kind of tease that at the end a little bit, but it doesn't actually uh, happen. Yeah, they do tease it a little bit. I was waiting for Eric to show up, the Phantom of the Mall, to save him, but he didn't. Oh, I was waiting for Protector 101 to show up and just start shoot, blowing a head up. <laughs> <laughs> Have a nice day. Yeah, it did look like Chopping Mall. It, it didn't look like the same mall from Chopping Mall. Well, that's what I was thinking. I was like, why are they in a fucking mall? When's that robot going to come around the corner? And, and how many bowling alleys are in malls? Dick Miller's fucking and mopping up. <laughs> He's about, he just got electrocuted on the other side of the mall. On the rooftop, the cast of Day of the Dead is landing. <laughs> Dawn of the Dead, I'm sorry. Bowling Alley takes a lot of real estate. Oh, yeah. Uh, I, I mean, maybe I guess in LA they might have a, a bowling alley in a mall, but most bowling alleys I know of were all uh, their own building. Unless it's Kingpin, because I always think of Bill Murray had that fucking bowling alley in his house. Yeah, I mean, well, so did the guy from There Will Be Blood. Well, yeah, I mean, a small one. True. Uh, out here in Vegas, uh, bowling alleys are in the casinos and the hotels. So, and out in Jersey, though, they are separate buildings, and that's, you know, that's my two experiences with them. Well, I, yeah, I have been to that one, and I have been to that one in Vegas, and I forgot about that, but yeah, they do have bowling alleys in, in casinos, but they have everything in casinos. Yes, they do. <laughs> 
but you don't want any of that because it's way too expensive. <laughs> so we're introduced to the to the sorority babes that are being spanked. We got Brink Stevens and, and uh, Michelle Bauer here, guys. Lisa and Taffy. Yep, Taffy. Uh, as uh, Babs is the one with the paddle, right? Yeah, Babs is the. Uh, they, they forecast her too. Like they say, she's sadomasochistic, and you know what I mean. They, they again, everyone is so foreshadowed so far in advance. Do you think that? Uh, Babs, when she turns like into a demon, is like the alternate universe version of Blackie Lawless from the Dungeon Master. Ooh, hmm, that's that may be a whole podcast to itself. Yeah, <laughs> it's like the Loki thing, you know. But but it's actually it's actually Babs, <laughs> a, a variant, a, a timeline variant of Babs. Yeah, it's a variant. Yeah, she's the variant of Blackie. Also in a bowling alley. Yes. <laughs> See, um, when I when I heard the name Babs, my brain instantly goes to the horrors of Spider Island, which has this like ah. <laughs> stocky, like terrifying, but also like a woman who could tear up a pinup calendar, uh, like woman in there. Who I remember, there's a line in Mission Science Theater where they're like Babs Valentine. Yeah, they're like this is Babs, and Mike's like she's a former linebacker for the 49ers. <laughs> oh man, uh, I don't know. Uh. I, I think we saw two different movies. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't seen Babs. I haven't seen that movie in a long time. So I let I let Babs I let Babs I play ball with Babs. I'll just I'll just say that right now <laughs> for sure, man. <laughs> yeah, Br- Brink Brink and Michelle are veterans with Fred Olin Ray. Like, there's a lot of spillover. Like we were talking from Fred Olin Ray movies or Fred Olin Ray produced films uh, with the cast and crew here. How much? Uh, oh, yes, and, and, and how many showers do you think Brink Steven is, has taken in film? <laughs> I don't I don't think we got it all. Brink, let's do it one more time. <laughs> Her fucking body's like a prune. <laughs> oh, it's, Gran- it's Granny Van Dam. I, I what I don't understand is is that they've got the obligatory shower sheet. I guess that's the most logical way for someone to be completely naked for, for in a moment's notice for, for no good plot reason. Apparently, she likes being naked in general. Yeah, because she's like a marine biologist, and she's just like, yeah, I'm in movies, and like I like to be naked in movies. I think I read that somewhere. <laughs> okay. I mean, you know, that's fine. I'm not shaming her. I, I just think it's interesting from the purpose of these films. It's like they they can't think of any story reason. So it's always like just a fu- just a four minute shower scene. Just just arbitrarily placed in the movie somewhere. OK, well, we'll spray her with whipped cream and then we'll put her in the shower. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, like Michelle Bauer, she's just like, she's in Hollywood Chainsaw Hookers, which at the Mahoning, that too, uh, during VHS Fest, we were watching it on the big screen while uh, Fred Olin Ray was there with Hack the Movies. And we saw this woman cut Fred in half with a fucking chainsaw on the big screen. So that was amazing. <laughs> he was smiling. He was enjoying himself. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Good memories of getting cut in half. Oh, that was great. Oh, yeah. I died that day. That was something. <laughs> he was a trip, dude. So, you know, so you've got you've got the, you know, again and again, like at what point, like if you've made a bunch of these movies, is it just like another day at the office where it's like, OK, the distributor's not going to pick up, pick this up unless we've got this four minute shower scene in here? Or is there any excitement left on stage uh, 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 in the moment? Uh, when they're doing this uh, or is it just like good morning, Sam? Good morning, Ralph clock in take your boobs out i've complained about that a lot on this show and it's like i i get it it's like a thing it gets fucking asses in seats like i totally understand why like this movie i mean it's kind of the point it is a little excessive like it goes on for like a solid two minutes before they get caught but i'm like all right at this point it's like so many of these damn movies do this this is a dream yeah i i it could be this is an adolescent dream of, i'm just saying in general this is the dream of the adolescent yeah this is not a real world situation this is this is something that okay let, let's set the stage right it's the 1980s aids is happening nobody wants to have sex reagan is the president just say no to drugs you know, the, the, most people were living in very conservative households. They were latchkey kids and all they had was renting videos. So you're really supplying, you know, um, a lot of escapism for uh, a, a very, very, very uptight decade. I know that it, the 80s are remembered as being so carefree and wild, but that was the counterculture. That was the that was not the. That was not the um, description. That was the prescription for that decade. It was reactionary to what was going on. Mm. That's a very interesting perspective on that because I've never thought about it that way. But yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah, I I've literally never thought of that, and uh, that's 
yeah pretty interesting to, to say the least i always think of the 80s as the reactionary part but never ever think about what the rea- what brought the reaction yeah yeah exactly i mean i've i I've definitely thought about it a little bit. Just the second you mentioned Reagan, a fucking chill runs down my spine. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Sean. Again, we watch the movies and we just assume that that's the way it was. You know, was it all neon and side ponytails and drugs and <laughs> monsters and shit? In my case, like, and we've told stories about, uh, you know, me and Joe have told stories about going to the same video store in Times River, New Jersey, uh, A to Z. Um, that was... Uh, like renting all this stuff and all these like horror films and sci-fi films that that was the only escape I had for a long time because I for not to get into it but I was basically housebound for like f- four or five years I had very limited time outside the house because of circumstances that I won't get into um but this is my way out of that so yeah my only viewpoint into this decade was through all of this you know it this counterculture stuff so I never ever had a moment to think about why any of this even happened in the first place. But it felt good watching it for sure. Yeah, it <laughs> That's did. why we still do. <laughs> and I and I think what's missing too is that people don't look at these films with a degree of that they're self-aware, that they're campy. They know exactly what they're doing. They, these are not people making a serious movie and they're not making something that they think reflects real life or even reflects real values. I think they're, they're definitely making something that is pure escapism and, um, you know, going there because it's because we can't really go there, you know? Yeah, absolutely. But you know where we're going to go. Yeah. Speaking of going there, uh, <laughs> we 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 go to this Bolarama, baby, because uh, they get there. Uh, they meet Lania Quigley and they let this imp out <laughs> of this. <laughs> well, <laughs> Lania Quigley, by the way, is robbing the joint. Yeah. Lania Quigley's not a sorority, babe, which is what you would think. Yeah. Right. I was looking for her for. For like a hot minute and then i was like what the fuck and then she like shows up i was like oh okay she picked this role david dicato was like what do you want she's like i want this one and then there she is yeah spider i'm a hardened criminal <laughs> i'm breaking into this joint are those glasses for fucking real or what yeah yep yeah. mm-hmm. i thought she's gonna steal them from him <laughs> Are these worth anything? Oh, man. Yes, very stupid. Because, like, the whole setup is, like, they do this whole pledge thing, and they're going to, you know, yeah. Babs is going to make the, the girls and the guys that were peeping go steal this bowling trophy from this uh, bowl of ramen that her father runs. And so they sneak in. They go into the fucking security room to spy on them and, like, fuck with them. And they meet Lania. And they find the uh, the trophy. Yes. Because they're sent there to, to get the trophy as part of the initiation. And as Lobo said before, we don't even know what these sorority babes uh, in the mall, Bolarama, what have you, are trying to do to them. Like, what's the what's the ultimate scare they're trying to pull? They're just watching them in, in some, like, fucking secret room in the security cams. Yeah, it, you almost feel like they should have, you know, maybe flashed the lights on and off or did some things to scare them. And then when the real scary stuff happens... Turn the sprinklers on. When the real scary stuff happens, the other two could say to Babs, are you doing this? No, I'm not. It's out of my control. Something new is happening. But they don't have that at all. It's like, and and we, so we never really know what their plan really is, other than it's just a device to have them there to be turned into minions for for the imp. Now, I, I have to go back. A little bit, though, guys, because we did we have we uh, before we get into the imp, we're not going to be able if we get into the imp, we're not going to be able to talk about George Buckflower. True. (laughs) Yes. This this fucking security guard who's stuck in a closet most of the movie. Dude, this is my favorite character in the whole fucking movie. Uh, Now, now, George Buckflower plays every goddamn drunk, wino, abusive stepfather, uh, uh, you know, hobo. Uh, uh, you know, it, it just like this goes on and on. If you do yourself a favor and go to the IMDb and look up George Buck Flower, he's got a scraggly beard and he's got like a, a, a really, uh, uh, gravelly voice. And he was the, he was the wino in Escape from New York who has the president's, uh, uh, wrist, uh, communicator on where he's like, Oh, I, I knew when I found this, I'd be the president. You gotta live, you gotta live lavishly. Look, hail to the team. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So he was that guy. He's the wino bum in They Live. He's the wino bum in Back to the Future and Back to the Future 2. 
you know, it, just start watching movies and look at every single single wino, bum, hobo. 90% of the time, it's going to be George Buckflower. He's in Pumpkinhead. Yeah, he's, he's, the, he's the farmer in Pumpkinhead. He's like a deputy in Tammy and the T-Rex. Uh, I think he's even a hobo in Wishmaster, to tell you the truth. Yeah, I think you're right. And, and in Waxworks, Waxwork 2, he's the drunk uh, stepfather in Waxwork uh, 2. Yes, I have never seen the second waxwork. So what? Lost in time like a bug in a jar? Wherever you go, there you are? Oh, man. I have not. Yeah. I've always seen the cover at a video store and like have, like I'm familiar with it, but I've never actually watched it. I caught the first one on the sci-fi channel, which is where I caught like most of these movies. Sig Volson's in the second one, dude. This movie, you know, speaking of waxwork, I, I think if this movie came out a year later, there would have been a rap at the very end describing everything that happens in the movie. Oh my god. Oh my god. <laughs> this guy's like a secret MDU icon because he's like in Munchie too. And I think Joe said Tammy and the T Rex. He's all over the place. Yeah, he's one of our that guys. Yeah, he's one of our that guys. But yeah, George Buckflower, he's a janitor in this. And yeah, he is it, and way too much hearing aid shtick with this guy. Yeah. It goes on a little too long. Uh some of it some of it's funny. Some of it's very good, like uh later on when she's like she's like you stay here and he's like you know what i can't hear you i have an idea i'll just stay here right yeah lania yelling at george flower while he's doing his hearing aid shtick is hilarious to me yes what i think is really bizarre is that they're trying to convince him that there's an imp stuck in a trophy that is killing people and then when he relays the story from the 50s that there was an imp that was trapped in a trophy that was killing people linnea says that's ridiculous. I've never heard <laughs> such an unbelievable story in my life. Hey, hey, David. David DiCato. Maybe you should have went over this script a little more. I know there probably was just an outline with some bullet points, but... uh. Oh, dude, there's like one page of script and the rest is just one takes, dude. They're like, all right, we got it. Let's go. Next thing. It's just it's just written in crayon. And, and to his defense, maybe that was another self-aware joke. Sure. It's just in the hands of people who uh, have no intonation in their voice. Mm -hmm. Maybe that doesn't come across <laughs> i love you linnea oh my god i just have this feeling that says now she's just never gonna want to talk to me if she ever hears this oh we all love her i was gonna say this is this is the most polite throttling of someone's performance i've ever heard in my life it like it really is like you're you're you have great intentions, but you're like, man. <laughs> it's it's one of those things, though, where it's like, I think we all love her to differing degrees because she is one of those horror icons. And she's a royal. She's royal. Oh, yeah. And she's. Yeah, for sure, man. She's had she has so many uh, memorable roles over the years. Yeah. And I did enjoy the fact that she is the like the de facto lead in this because I've never seen anything where she is a lead character where she's driving the action because once she kind of gets involved, like this dude just kind of follow her, follows her around. Now I love her as Suzanne in Night of the Demons, and I love her. Um, I actually, I actually do love her in this movie, just because like I, I am that nerd that likes the hot, uh, crazy goth, tough chick, yeah, mm -hmm. whatever punker chick, and of course trash in Return of Living Dead. But I watched Murder Weapon for the first time because Vinegar Syndrome put out uh, like this David D. Coteau, like double feature thing with Lania Quigley, um, and one of them was Murder Weapon, and that's the first time I ever saw that movie, and. Um, She's a lead in that. And like, again, I love Linnea, but <laughs> having having a lot of her in it, definitely, you know, some of the flaws start to come out. But like, you know, it, I still love it, you know? Totally get that. Without being like too, without being too like, I don't know, <laughs> de detrimental. Yeah, I mean, there, you know, there is... It's it, it. You don't know the conditions under which these movies were are made. Yeah. You don't know how much time they have to really go over what they're doing. The fact is, is that she did. She was there. She did the job, and, and every you know everyone there it does seem committed to what they're doing. I don't think anyone in this movie is sleepwalking through it. No. 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 Not at all. Uh. It. It. It just. But I do feel like you can give some some somebody a little more than they can chew on. But some of that responsibility is the director's responsibility, where they're like, hmm, you know, maybe we didn't get that. Maybe we could do one more read on that, and maybe like raise your voice up in this part of the sentence. 
<laughs> she she does she does really good in Murder Weapon though. What I do think in this movie, and I didn't mean to interrupt everybody, but I want to say this just this is my last Linnea thing. But at least in this movie, again, this movie's so self aware. I think it knows all its own problems because at some point. He goes, you know, do you say everything sarcastically? So I think they they should have hammered that on early. If they hammer that a little early on, I think that that, that would that because that would be a hilarious character to where that's just the affect of the character. And everyone there knows that that's the gag of that character is that, you know. I'm being sarcastic. Can you tell? <laughs> sure. Right. <laughs> sure. You know, so, but again, you know, so I, I, again, these are movies that know what they are. And like even Hobgoblins, who's got the, which has the same exact plot somehow. Yes. <laughs> is almost a parody of this movie, which makes me think this movie's a parody of something else. I mean, these must have been all uh, well-worn tropes in these kinds of movies by this time. A hundred percent. And speaking of Hobgoblins, the star uh, of this film is the imp. Uh, I think it's time to get into this imp. He gets released from this bowling trophy. Hello, baby. (laughs) (laughs) So it was at this moment where I was like, oh, fuck. It's another movie, but a tiny fucking ankle biter monster. God fucking damn it. (laughs) It's your favorite thing in the world. It's my least favorite thing in the world. So that's why you don't like this movie. Uh, well, no, 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 long stretches. I was like, like I said in the chat, like I had to get up and like do a cartwheel to have some adrenaline pumping through me because at some point I was like, do something. <laughs> oh my God, come on. <laughs> it's not that bad. I was pretty entertained for like 90% of this. That's uh, not my cup of tea. I mean, I'm not saying I liked it, but I was entertained. So, so the imp gets released from, from the, uh, from the bowling trophy and he is voiced by Dookie Flyswatter. Um, this guy plays Mangala in the Surf Nazis, uh, 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 Surf Nazis Must Die by Troma. Um, and he had his own, uh, punk band. I believe it's called Haunted Garage. I have a Dookie Flyswatter story when you're ready. We don't have to go there now, but I do have a Dookie Flyswatter story. Oh, no, we could totally go there now. Uh, and it turns out he was like a good friend of old, uh, Fred Olin Ray, too. And they did the Tomb, Cyclone, and Commando squad together. And he also wrote Blood Diner, so there you go. Oh, um, Michael Sanye is is his real name. Michael Sanye is his real name. And and I, I guess I shouldn't have said that first, but <laughs> I I I put out a DVD of one of my episodes with a 3D film called Murders in 3D. Um, it was the Bob Wilkins Halloween special, and uh, to sort of r- kind of pad out the running time, we added that as kind of an extra feature. And the DVD came with 3D glasses, and there was a skull with 3D glasses on the front. And they sold a lot of them. It was a, it was a big seller for us. I won't lie. When Alpha put it out, they didn't put that movie on it because um, that movie actually technically is not public domain. So uh, again, another uh, we didn't know that at the time, and we didn't get in trouble, but we just just opted to just not when they're re-released to just leave it off and not have it 3d um but when it came out we had this uh kind of nasty review on amazon and it was like worst 3d ever i have huge collection michael sanye <laughs> i felt michael's why does that sound familiar michael sanye holy crap that's dookie flyswatter <laughs> You know, obviously, you know, the distributor has all his information because he ordered the DVD. And so I contacted him and I said, you know, would you like your money back or whatever? And we had this whole conversation about all his films. It really was Dookie Flyswatter. He was in Rollerblade Warriors. He was in Surf Nazis Must Die as Mengele. He was um, uh, and he named himself after. Escape from New York, bring it back to George Buckflower. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Escape from New York. He, he, when he saw Escape from New York, he wanted to be the Duke, the Duke of New York. And he would do this really bad Isaac Hayes impression. Nine, one, one. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Uncle Sam, everybody. Go listen to the episode. It definitely, he definitely gets the deepness from it for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, so probably, you know, he was doing the, his Isaac Hayes, his, uh, you know, uh, uh, Isaac Hayes impression. Call, I'm the, I'm the Duke of New York. I'm a number one. And his friends mocking him started calling him Dookie instead of the Duke. <laughs> <laughs> 
poor bastard. Oh my god, it's so fucking petty. So then he just sort of owned it. <laughs> I am Dookie. Yeah, so when he, he he had his real name in the first couple of Fred Olin Ray films that he was in, but when it came around to like this one and Surf Nazis and some of the others, he just figured he needed a gnome de plume. And I think he was in his punk band anyway, and I think he just that was just the name he chose was Dookie Flyswatter. And uh, so that was that. I had a little nice conversation with him and and uh you know he we ended up uh you know editing on 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 good terms you know he didn't he didn't want his refund for his dvd and uh so that's my dookie flyswatter story (laughs) i like that dookie flyswatter sounds like a a blues singer from the simpsons or something like it sounds like something they totally made up (laughs) so speaking of blues blues singer from the simpsons you have this like uh you know white guy who played a nazi (laughs) doing a robust african-american voice as the imp yeah yeah kind of weird think think like oogie boogie like a dime store oogie boogie oh that is exactly what it is it's very oh my god but oogie boogie didn't exist so they're all doing uh there it's a whisper oh screaming jay hawkins yeah whisper down the lane it's it's uh, uh, Dookie Flyswatter imitating Levi Stubbs, who was Audrey II, imitating Screaming Jay Hawkins from the 50s. <laughs> that's what that's what you're dealing with. It's an imitation of an imitation of an imitation. With a little bit of Isaac Hayes stank on it, yeah. With a little bit of the Isaac Hayes. You're the Duke. <laughs> you're the Duke of New York. You're a number one. <laughs> I gotta say, though, if I, you know, I like to put myself in the shoes of characters when I'm watching these kind of movies. I don't know. I'm kind of with Calvin. Although I would have fucking booked it the hell out of there before anything happened. I'm like, okay, an imp came out of a fucking uh, trophy and gave uh, Hal Havens a pile of gold. All right, I'm out. I'll see you tomorrow. Yeah, I'm done. I'm out. Are you kidding me? This this thing starts granting wishes. You wouldn't ask this thing for a wish? I mean, you got my tongue a little bit here, but I'd be kind of <laughs> freaked out that it came out of the trophy. I'm not going to lie. No way. I would not. I would not. I would not ask for a wish from that damn imp. I've seen enough movies to know how these things go. Oh, uh, well, yeah. <laughs> I, I honestly, you know, I mean, honestly, it, it, when does get granting wishes from a monster ever result in anything good? Right. I've seen Wishmaster. I know what happens to Kane Hodder. Yeah, you catch one of those little demons from the gate and they all everything turns to shit. Yeah, and then one of the big ones, Mama, comes out of the fucking hole. And then you're in trouble. <laughs> now, when George Buckflower starts telling the story of the imp and, and talking about I mean, I guess I guess I never really connected King Solomon with the whole genie and the lamp story yeah i didn't know king solomon did that i i know king solomon had and i had to research this king solomon had domain over all sorts of creatures both animals and people and supernatural beings and the jinn i guess and the jinn which are basically which are basically genies and he supposedly there was one genie that didn't accept god or wouldn't renounce whatever demonic crap that genies are into jafar and so jafar right no. <laughs> i was going to say rumple stiltskin but okay and then he puts the genie in a jar not a lamp puts it in a jar he seals it with his ring he's got a uh 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 he's got a the seal of solomon yeah yeah the seal of solomon he puts his seal on top of this jar and then because he has this domain over over all living creatures, the thing is just trapped in there and he throws the jar in the ocean. Now, I had to read I had to like do homework and read that to know that story. And they do a really crappy job of explaining the, the King Solomon. And I, maybe they're doing that on purpose. Wow, that does sound like the Rumpelstiltskin movie. The 90. 90- That's what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, the 94 one with Max Grodenchik. Yeah. It sounds frighteningly similar to that plot of that movie, actually. Well, because, yeah, it's like, you know, you go most of the movie, it's just like, all right, it's an imp, it's it's evil, obviously, but you don't know, and then you get, uh... That's what imps do, goofy! Yeah, well, then you get the story from the security guard from Buck Flowers, and he's just, like, cursing and drinking through the whole fucking story, like, you know, just repeating himself and just, <laughs> well, this happened, and, you know, this guy, he, he got... A perfect 300, like 10 times in a row in the bowling match, and then all of a sudden all this bad shit started happening, and then he, and then he said, oh, well, he, he summoned this imp with black magic, and uh, I, I guess you could just uh, kick it in the ass right back into the uh, cup or something, I don't know. You put it in the headlock, and you kick it in the ass, and you stuff it back in the trophy or whatever, I guess. <laughs>
<laughs> Very good. <laughs> I think you guys need to take it on the road with like dueling buck flowers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Dueling buck flowers. Yeah, it sounds like a good idea. Yeah, you know. Well we'll we'll talk about everything between when they when they open it and uh this point, but uh I just that that, that cracked me up because then you have that joke too where Linnea's, you know, like we were talking about earlier, where oh I can't hear you and then she repeats herself, I can't I'm just gonna do what you said, but I'm gonna say it myself, and then she's like, Good idea. They do that again. In the story where she's like, there's an imp in a trophy. He's like, huh? An imp in a trophy? Yeah, an imp in a trophy. Huh? An imp in a trophy. Yeah, an imp in a trophy. Well, let me tell you about this story from 30 years ago when we found an imp in a trophy. Uh, what? No, not a bird, an imp. I do love that. She's like, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. And he goes, not a bird, an imp. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she, they should have called the cops. Yeah, there's there's a bunch of gags there, yeah. Oh, yeah, right, right. Yeah, exactly. She said something about what rhymed with cops. I can't remember. Pop. She says pops. Like Pops. Yeah, something like that. This is a bunch of crap pops or whatever. And then she's like, <laughs> yeah, that's right. They should have called the cops. <laughs> and it's just like, it's too much, though. Like, I feel like they go to that well, like, so many times. Too many times. No, this is funny. Leave it in. It'll be, it's like, it's padding. It's good. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of padding in this movie, I'll say that, where it's just like, let's lose, let's use every second of this scene. You could cut 30 minutes from this, like, easy. Yeah, no, you could make an episode of the Monsters TV series out of this movie really easy. Yeah, oh yeah, that would have been way better. Just cut the nudity and you're good. I would have preferred that, honestly. A clean 22 minutes could have told this story. Satisfying 22 minutes, yeah. A satisfying 20, yeah, would have been the best episodes of Monsters <laughs> ever. Which, yes. Which doesn't merely say much, but still right up there with mr schlobber yeah yeah i i think what's interesting is that i remember the first part of this movie really well and i remember the last part of this movie not so well and i realized that again at some point the movie just loses its damn mind and doesn't stops making any sense whatsoever oh yeah, yeah. but the other thing is is that there's a drive-in movie ethic and this is something that uh, i worked with um ted v michaels where i was an assistant director on on a movie that Ted V. Michaels made. And he he was talking about cinematography and specifically drive-in movies is that when, especially when the budget is poor and there isn't a lot to see, they just keep making it darker. Yeah. And and they they do just their just very basic key lighting, side lighting, just enough to give you a hint of what's going on. And they don't really show you a whole lot. And I feel like a lot of this movie is kind of lit like that, where it's murky and dark. And, and, you know, again, we were talking at the beginning of the promise of, you know, a bowling alley and all that kitsch and all, you know, all those cool hardwood floors and like 50s decor and boomerangs. And and we don't get any of that. We don't you know, they could have shot this in an empty warehouse and called it a bowling alley because you don't really get to see very much of the bowling alley. No. Well, okay, well, we do get Hal Havin's head ripped off and thrown down <laughs> there like a bowling ball. We do get that. Yes, we do. You do. Um, That that head has got some mobility to it, too. That's I think goes far for being just basically a you know a, <laughs> a a weird shaped fucking you know it's a skull it shouldn't roll like that <laughs> yeah because what, what do they do stick his head in the ball polisher what the fuck do they do to this guy uh, got a head sorry you lose i love my job <laughs> my work right i love my work yeah there's a scene where like someone walks i think they i think it's linnea and uh the the lead nerd like walk up to a corpse they're like yep they're dead i'm like i can't even see the corpse that you're talking about like it doesn't have a pulse <laughs> yeah that that scene <laughs> there's a lot of sitting like like Linnea and Calvin do a lot of sitting in like dark hallways and dark bathrooms and they're like eh, what are we gonna do I don't know uh, I guess we'll just wait there's like a full fucking hobbit moment in the novel <laughs> where like Calvin gets fucking knocked out and then wakes up and Linnea's like, oh, you were, well, you were sleeping. I devised this whole plan that we didn't show on screen. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's why, you know, I'm kind of joking when I say this, but it's like proto Night of the Demons. Like Night of the Demons took a lot of these ideas and honed it and it even has like half the cast in it. But it's like, <sighs> there's just a lot of, co like I've never seen Hobgoblin, so I can't personally make that comparison. Now I have to based on what you guys are saying, but it's just like, I'm just thinking about, okay, they're in a location people start getting turned into demons or so like one of them gets turned into the bride of Frankenstein for some reason. Yeah. And, and then they just start killing their friends. It's like, all right. Hobgoblins has this great dynamic thing where like they like because of the immobility of the puppets, they like mind control people, which is kind of neat. Okay. Yeah. And Hobgoblin's also way busier than this movie. Ho 
Hobgoblin has like a gag like every minute or so. And then by the end of it, you're like, what the fuck is <laughs> happening? Well, but it's similarly how a, a character suddenly becomes Rambo. Well, you have a character suddenly become the Bride of Frankenstein, right? Because magic is involved and, and we can just go do as many genre tropes as we want to. Yeah. Oh, oh and by the way, the, the imp has electronically locked or electricity locked the entire mall. So can we talk about the beautiful art of hand animated lightning in these 80s movies the rotoscoping lighting effects are amazing and connor don't you dare say anything negative about hellraiser right now (laughs) hey man the first hellraiser is aged like milk all right what are you talking about quiet both of you i love hellraiser one and two okay (laughs) two is my favorite horror film of all time Uh, i'm just saying the ending you get to the ending you're like Okay, I'll accept it. I think it looks great. I don't know. You're crazy. I think it looks a little weird. They drew that on a celluloid fucking film. Yeah. I still appreciate it. I just look at it and go like, meh. I mean, it looks better than the peanut that Slimer is going around that goddamn chandelier. Oh, no, man. I, I was just about to say the Ghostbuster stuff looks, still looks amazing, especially the proton streams and and all of the uh, ghosts escaping from the- uh, Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, the containment unit and stuff. Like, that stuff's amazing. Yeah, and we, uh, I talk about it all the time, but Howard the Duck has, like, some of the most mind-blowing effects and, like, lightning effects I've ever seen in my fucking life. Oh, my goodness. I would say, uh, Big Trouble in Little China has, like, the best that I can think of, those lightning effects. Yes. Uh, some of them done by, uh, Craig Clark, who, uh, has a show on, on OSI 74, but yeah, cool stuff. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, I love the concept, too, and just real quick, just, like, them riding the lightning, like, literally down, you know what I mean? It's just so cool. Yeah, I like sliding down it, yeah. I wanted to go back to something Joe said, where there's a lot of times where uh, Linnea and uh, uh, nerd number one, as uh, Lobo has called him, (laughs) (laughs) are, like, kind of singing together, and um, there's one moment where they're having a conversation, and I heard a sound bite that lit up my fucking brain, and Joe knows exactly what I'm talking about here. (laughs) It is when Linnea quickly says, yeah, it was stupid. Really stupid. That is the outro to I'm With Stupid by Static X, the band that just won't go away this year. Then every time we discover them. Or last year or the year before. You have your court appointed cut from the can now for Sorority Babes in the Slimeball Bolorama with Static X. I I have no idea what the fuck. Well, actually, yeah, I can probably just do something with that real quick. <laughs> Actually, not, actually, now that you're saying it, it's it's very clear in my head. Damn it! So, so they, so the one guy wishes for gold, right? Right. Yeah. And, and I always think it's funny because in movies, people always wish for giant piles of gold. I mean, you just can't walk into a bank with a giant <laughs> pile of gold and say this is mine. You can't even pick it up. No, that's what I'm saying. Or, or you wish for twelve doubloons. <laughs> yeah. And a completely bare floor except that sack. Go, go listen to WordPresser. From the gods, or whatever the fuck it's called. Word processor of the gods, yeah. T- talks from the dark side. Yeah. I just, I don't understand that, just that, I I, I don't know. Like, I, you know, I mean, I don't know. I guess this guy... I'm, I'm with you. Give me a big pile of fucking Benjamins. Just call it a day. Yeah, sure. A credit card. You know? Yeah, exactly. Well, I've always said like I feel, I feel like gold, and like I said in the case of the blooms, like I always feel like in that case, it's we have a prop. Let's use it. You know. Don't be like Morty because he asked for that gold. I'm surprised the imp didn't put like tw- like a hundred pounds of gold bars in Hal Haven's stomach. Well, like Leprechaun too. Oh no. Yeah, like Leprechaun too, like Morty. <sighs> the other thing is, is that okay? So he asks for gold, of course, and 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 again, he's he's gonna talk. He's talking about how many Ferraris he's gonna buy. He's gonna get his nails done too. Nails and hair done. Yeah, this, again, those are jokes. These guys know. They know. Yeah. And I, w- the thing that I don't understand is that okay. First of all, I don't even know how much gold a Fer- how much gold is needed to buy a ferrari like i don't know how many ferraris can <laughs> <laughs> one bar please like he he's got the exchange rate figured out because he knows exactly what he's going to do with all that gold i'm imagining a man walking into a car dealership and going like i'll take that one Boom, and just slams a gold bar in the couch. why does everybody want to buy a ferrari when they're, when they're rich like why not just like Buy a house. Yeah. What's the biggest piece of shit you have here that I can pay to maintain with this gold bar? Wake up in the morning where you don't have to do anything, but no, I'm going to go buy like 20 Ferraris. But then you have like the other uh, wishes where it's like the one girl just wants to be prom queen because she never won prom queen. Yeah. So he just he just puts her address. He's like, there you go. Done. Yeah. And w- let's go back for a second. Now that the, the, the nerd number two or Jefferson Jefferson. 
<laughs> or whatever his name is, Keith or guy who makes the most fucked up wish possible. Yeah, he wants the other girl to be hot for him, right? Yeah, he wants Michelle Bauer to, you know, do him. And so Lisa ceases to be herself and it turns into this sex maniac dressed in 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 something from Victoria's Secret. Fredericks of Hollywood. Or Fre- yeah, yeah, you're right. <laughs> totally Fredericks of Hollywood. I take that back. You 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 got it 100% with with Fredericks of Hollywood. So so Fredericks of Hollywood and then suddenly she's just and it's the it's the thing like from the Warner Brothers cartoons where the canary is trying to jump in the cat's mouth so badly that the cat is freaking freaked out. <laughs> Like the 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 cat, Sylvester doesn't even want Tweety Bird anymore because Tweety is coming on so hard, trying to climb into his mouth with such ferocity that it's turning him off. Yeah, go, go ahead, climb in. The, I'll climb in there. Let Grandma walk home. Okay, or walk in. <laughs> so, so I feel like uh, I feel like that's kind of what's happening him. Where he, it's like it, it's like, oh, okay, you want this girl? Okay, she she's so into you that you don't even know how to handle it. And so, so she jumps on top of him, and she's. <laughs> She's, uh, you know, riding on him and grinding on him and forcing him to touch her. And and what's funny is, is that he's trying to explain the moral and psychological and uh, philosophical problems with this whole thing <laughs> to her. <laughs> But he doesn't really do a very good job of convincing the audience or himself or her. No. He he's also doing it while she's taking his foot and just rubbing it against her face. So like <laughs> Yeah. And then he gets a face full of her boobs. He's like, oh, I wonder what the other guys are doing. <laughs> His resistance is a little, which should have been a cut, right? I don't know. I feel like I wonder what the other guys are doing was probably his way of saying, I've got nothing here. Can we end yeah. the scene? <laughs> no, please stop. No. We did a movie where there was a simulated sex scene, right? And now everyone who's seen Papatopoulos or everyone who knows how an 80s sex comedy is made or an, or a film is made knows that you have to have a sock, right? Yeah. Where's that sock guy? Put it on there. The heel goes over your boom boom and then the toe of the sock goes over your wah wah, right? <laughs> <laughs> We're adults here. We can say these things. So you got the heel of the the sock or, uh, covering your boom boom, and then your <laughs> the front of the sock there, and you and it stays on for the most part. It stays on. Have you ever seen the Gonzo Muppet? Yeah, it's kind of like that. Yeah, exactly. It's like having a Muppet on your junk. <laughs> so then, when you were on top of Brink Stevens or whoever in one of these movies you're not really touching her with your genitals. Sure. And there was a scene in, in with a simulated uh, sex. I mean, this movie, we won't say the name of with a simulated <laughs> sex scene. And where we had. Um, Is that the guy from? Uh, uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And um, nobody had a sock for him. How is that possible? I don't know. I would have just had somebody take a sock off or something. That's what I mean. Nobody on the set was wearing socks? Oh, no. I don't know how I feel about that. It's a flip-flop day, everybody. <laughs> nobody had a sock for him. And, and, and she was engaged, right? She, her, 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 her husband was there, okay? And so they end up trying to do the scene without the sock and, you know, nature happens. Yeah. And uh, it, everyone was embarrassed. And for the rest of the shoot, like nobody talked to him. Like everyone was so embarrassed that they just stopped talking to him. Oh. And it, it's, it's like he didn't do anything. And like, so he was like our best friend, like hung out with Dixie and I for like the whole rest of the shoot because everybody else was so embarrassed by that situation because that was a closed set. We weren't there. Oh, Anyway, so that that's uh, tell, telling tales out of school, but that 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 was my situation. So whenever I see a scene in these movies where a, a a guy and a gal are on top of each other, I always think of that that moment. Although in this case, I think he's wearing what five pairs of underpants, <laughs> and she's probably wearing four pairs of underpants. Somebody had to tape guy that kid. You know what I'm saying? They wrapped him up tight. Yeah, especially when she's grabbing his hands and sticking it on her tits. Like, there's no way. <laughs> the, uh, you know what's hilarious to me? So this whole scene happens and he, and he gets his wish or whatever. She is hot for the rest of the film. Yeah. 
I'm convinced that she wasn't really under a spell, especially because when Babs walks in, she recognizes Babs and she's like, hey, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah, that was weird. I was wondering if like the spell broke. I, I felt like, did I miss something? I, I, well, I don't know how these things work. I mean, she might still know who everybody is. She just wants to have sex with nerd number two, right? Right. I guess so. Like Hal, ha- like Hal Havin's gold turns to uh, gold painted wood and uh, Brink Stevens dress looks like trash. The prom dress. Yeah, I'm sorry. We didn't talk about the prom dress, but yeah, she wanted to be a prom queen. And so she's just spinning in a circle in her prom dress for like a half an hour. Then she turns into Una from Legend. I don't know. Something happens. Fern Gully. I think she was in her Fern Gully dress. Y- yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's when, you know, Hal Havens gets his head ripped off in the fucking ball polisher. Oh, yeah. And then, uh, you know, just to finish that whole scene with Lisa and Keith, Keith finally Finally, like gets the hell out of there. He can't do it, and uh, you know he's he's just like walking around in this dark fucking bowling alley, like the rest of them. And he's like, "Lisa, is that you?" And she's like, "No, it's Rhonda." And it's just like this woman that got turned into like some fucking zombie, and she just like fucking kills him from behind. Yeah. Well, we didn't talk about that because while all this stuff is happening, the sorority, the actual sorority babes, are just watching from the on the security cameras. Right. And then somehow the two second banana sorority babes get zapped with some more animated lightning through the screens, I guess. <laughs> and then they both become monsters. One a sort of a zombie dressed in clothes from the Gap. <laughs> yeah. And then Bride of Frankenstein. And then literally the Bride of Frankenstein only with an axe. Yeah, you're right. Demons question mark. Yeah. yeah. That's what I'm saying, man. Cherry picking from these other movies. Yeah. Even if they came after, I don't care. They're still cherry picking from them. I don't know. They're cannibal. They're all cannibalizing each other, though. Like, I feel like I feel like this is a circle jerk of <laughs> movies cannibalizing each other. Yeah. I mean, I don't know how much regard... They're all stealing from Go, so I don't know how, you know, if you steal from someone who's stealing from someone who's stealing from someone, where's the honor of it? Like, who's, you know, is is someone is someone really more, uh, you know, uh, to blame than, or at fault than someone else in that whole chain? Nah, yeah. I mean, I'm poking fun a little here. I mean, that's like the Italian shark movies, yeah. Oh, God, deep blood, still fucking, I, I still have burns in my brain from that one. Cruel Jaws is still is still the worst one for me. I, I'll have to watch it, because deep blood was like fucking nails on a chalkboard for me. But that's like the perfect example of like, taking from, stealing, like literally stealing from another ripoff from another ripoff and just cobbling it together. But the, the, another thing that's kind of weird about this movie, and I guess maybe they just needed the plot to move on, but at first, they can't kill Bride of Frankenstein or this this zombie woman because, oh, they're already dead. But then, like, at some point, Linnea Quigley finds a fucking pistol and shoots uh, the zombie chick a bunch of times, and then she dies? No, she doesn't die. Uh, well, no, she doesn't die because she comes back in the fucking car later. Oh, yeah, you're right. Okay. Which one gets hit in the face with the bowling ball? I think that's Bride? That might have been, I don't know. There's two of them that, that get fucked up constantly throughout this film. After they, because we've already talked about the scene, but they go to see, they, they finally find George Flower and he tells him, that, gives him the lowdown, but then he ends up getting killed by the Bride of Frankenstein and uh, she chases them. Doesn't he just stand in the doorway for like 20 minutes going, oh no, do not stab me in my chest. I should have fucking known. That fucking imp. That fucking imp, he let him out. Oh, that's what it is. That, that, and that's one thing, too. And I get, again, we talked about this a little already. I, I'm sure the budget was, I'm sure it was low, but then a car goes off a fucking ramp later. So who really knows? That was that was the rest of the budget, dude. They, they shot that first. Uh, there's just, there's there's some pretty cool kills in this movie, but it's a lot of cutaways. Like, you just see the before and after in most of these kills. There's one that confused the shit out of me because it's just like, it's dark, and then I hear cracking noises. I'm like, I don't know what they're doing. Like, <laughs> did they did, did they break her legs? Did they tr- break uh, 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 Brink's legs? Like, I don't understand what those monsters are doing when they're pulling on her. I don't know. Taffy. Well, she's Taffy. They're ripping her in half. Oh, there you go. That's the gag. Oh, they're twisting and and ripping her in half. Yeah. Yeah. But, like, even, like, uh, when Hal Havens gets killed, like, they stick his head in that ball polishing thing, and then they come out, and it's all bloody, and then they stick his hand in it, and then the next shot is, oh, his head's ripped off. It's like, okay. Every time something happens, we just cut back to this, this same shot of the imp, and and it's the same shot every time, and he just adds commentary to what's happening. He's like, oh, it looks like you got, you know, got a ball or whatever. And he's like, okay, little babies, you know, we're gonna, I don't know what, uh, 
I don't even know what. I'm going to go behind the uh, bowling pins where there's a little lighting and you kind of see me a little better for this one scene. Yeah. He, oh, yeah. He breaks it down to Babs because Babs doesn't get possessed yet. Well, I guess we can talk about that. Yeah, she gets possessed. Well, and Babs becomes like the penultimate uh, S&M bondage dominatrix. Yeah. The the uh, the, the var- She becomes a variant of uh, Blackly Lawless. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because a, var- <laughs> a variant. Yeah. <laughs> but he but the, the imp's like, oh, you know, uh, let me answer your question. Shut up. He's like, I'm an imp. And I am uh, the most powerful imp, and that's all you need to know. So now you're under my control. There you go. Take my testimony of nobody else's. Yeah. <laughs> why are you doing this? Because I got to. I'm an imp, Goofy. Well, and, and and why does he say that, that, that Babs is taking the place of the other one? Because the other one's still there. I don't know. I, well, that's the thing, because they show Linnea shoot it. So I think for the audience, it's like, oh, it's dead. But then it's like in the car later. So you're right. It makes no sense. You're going to take her place. Boogity boogity sorority babes. Boogity 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 boogity. My bugs. <laughs> but then, but then he sends like Babs after uh, Lisa, who's just now just like sitting there naked, waiting for Keith to come back. Who's you know he's dead at this point. She doesn't know that. Still under the influence. Yeah, I. You know, again, they're just trying to keep the sex aspect of it up, and she's the only one holding that part up anymore. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> she's got the whole weight of it on her boobs. Cause the, cause there's the, what is the, what, what do they call those movies where it's like rack and stack or whatever? It's like half violence and then half boobies, you know, where it's like, Oh yeah, I, I guess. Usually it's the front of the movie that's all violence. And then the back of the movie, it's supposed to say something about what kind of movie it is. If like, if it has all the sex up front and the violence on the back, that's the, that's, I guess that would be the rack and stack. And then <laughs> right. it's, it's Eli Roth's hostel is what you're telling me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So then the other one is the, if you have the boobs in the back and the violence in the front, right? Or they just say the same thing twice. We all know what you're talking about. I mean, this, this movie, you know, puts it throughout the whole thing. Yeah. This movie's got boobs throughout the whole thing, but again, it, it, it's forced boobs throughout the whole thing. Yeah. Uh, and then, uh, uh, yeah, so she's waiting for, uh, 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 Keith uh, to come back, but Keith is dead. Oh, he got his head stuck in a deep fryer, yeah. Now, how turn the deep fryer on? Because you usually don't leave it with boiling oil in it after the boiling, uh, bo- after the alley's been closed. The imp wanted some french fries, dude, I guess. Okay. Oh, maybe. Go in the kitchen and make me some dinner. Ooh, I love some french fries. I don't know. That imp wants a McRib. <laughs> <laughs> That's for sure. Oh, I'll have the McRib, please. Thank you. I haven't had one in 30 years. What do you mean you don't have on the menu right now? It's a barbecue and a bun without the bones. <laughs> frame grilled goodness. More. So that Lisa gets killed off screen. So yeah, so Babs turns into a demon or whatever, and um, and the Bride of Frankenstein ends up trying to kill. After she kills George Flowers, she gets tries to kill um, Linnea and Calvin, and they have like this fight with like this axe, and Linnea cuts her head off, and the head flies into the door. Yeah, and st- and stops the electricity, like negates it, because apparently George Flowers like. It magic beats magic or whatever. And Calvin's like, that's it. Magic beats black magic. I guess the door's open now. And he goes outside to drive a car off a ramp. I mean, do you think that that stock footage of a car flipping and they just had to find a car that was sort of similar that he could get into and try to get away? Maybe. But why? Why does he get in the car anyway and drive away? Like, like, because uh, I feel like they just had to use that production value. Like, I feel like that they <laughs> felt like, or maybe there's a, is there a car flipping in the trailer? Like, is, is there just something where they just, they just knew they needed to have a car flipping in it? We got boobs. We need the car flip. We got the, we got the decapitation. Go. Wait, go back to that second thing. What'd you say? <laughs> <laughs> the boobs. Lobo, you've been talking about for most of this how they, they were very self aware and they knew what they were making. And I love how, you know, we talk about this a lot in the show because it's always coming up in movies this killer in the back seat scenario it's like ah it always happens you should have seen it coming yeah yeah exactly even the imp says it oh this trick in the book a monster in the back seat uh, i kind of love that because yeah. we've had that many times it's like larry the larva chucky the kindred oh yeah man chucky uh leatherface yeah bouncing in that car man and, and I guess, yeah, I guess the, the idea is that, you know, he they, they think they're safe. What would have been really interesting if they had that car flip and it would have been a different kind of movie. But if he and Linnea got in a car and they thought they were safe and they were driving in their big escape and then the monster jumps and grabs him from behind and the whole car flips and that's the end of the movie. And the one demon just gets out and walks off. <laughs> 
let me tell you something. That is the that is the end of Calvin. Okay, there's he's not walking away from that wreck. <laughs> I thought he was dead. Calvin's got bones made of adamantium. Somehow he does. Some some sometimes he somehow he just crawls out. His little his little weeny bones just bend, <laughs> and he just is fine. <laughs> just real quick before we wrap this up, uh, Babs is dispatched via Molotov cocktail. Um, she's lit on fire and then we never see it again. Yes, this is beautiful because this is everyone who gets caught on fire in an 80s movie where there is a little bit of fire and suddenly there is a gi- a guy in a giant suit engulfed <laughs> who thrashes around for like four seconds and he's usually four or five times the body mass of the person who is getting caught on fire and they it's usually like they pat the right shoulder and then they pat the left shoulder and then they fall to their knees and then they fall on their face and i feel like they just that's that same move because you only got four seconds to do everything before the guys have to run in and 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 shoot you down with fire extinguishers and put you out and they, and you probably still end up spending the next three days in the hospital. It's covered in it's covered in uh, a fire extinguisher smoke, and and David D. Coteau is on the side flipping his fucking notebook and checking it off on his checklist. <laughs> Boobs, f- uh, uh, stunt guy on fire, uh, the flipped car. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Car flip, <laughs> shower scene. Yeah, boom, boom, boom. Check, check, check. Again, on the other side of this mall, chopping mall's happening, and Barbara Crampton just got lit on fire by a canister of gasoline. So it's it's <laughs> it's all happening at the same time. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And it's the same guy getting caught on fire. <laughs> same same stunt man. They paid him for the whole day. And they just got his five movies made. You heard this up? I have to go get killed in chopping mall in about five minutes. <laughs> Before we uh, can this up, quote unquote, we never uh, we never talked about the music in this movie, and it's so fucking good. Uh, the music sounds like some awesome eighty. 80- goth club crescendo shit i'm kind of all about it yeah but it kind of sounds a little bit like the like the automatic like like the casio keyboard demo it sounds a little bit like that <laughs> a little bit it's all done by guy moon i'm really into it i love here how's the here in the dark how's the here in the darkness s- song go i love that here in the darkness yeah <laughs> here in the darkness 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 that's the whole song man that's the whole song i love it too it is great in its own way uh and yes but yeah it's incredible just the it's the best pre-programmed electronic disco that 1985 had to offer excellent demo casio thanks only outdone by public image in uh, hardware. <laughs> this is what you want. This is what you get. Yeah. Do, do you remember when ABC Saturday Morning used that as their theme? No. What? What? Yes. For the Saturday Morning cartoons, they had like, this is what you want. This is what you get. One Saturday morning, they like used it for their, yeah, they used it for their Saturday, they used PIL as a, uh, for, uh, <laughs> for the, as the ad in the Saturday morning cartoon lineup. That's fucking bizarre. I'm sure that's on YouTube. We're digging that out and posting that for sure. Digging it up. I'm old. I know stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so Linnea cans this fucking imp. She sneaks up behind him and puts him in a tobacco can. And that's it. You know, because you've got a tobacco can in a bowling alley. <laughs> yeah. I love how she's got to throw a one-liner out first just to give him a chance. Any chance in hell to get away, but he doesn't. What's the one-liner? Consider yourself canned. Oh, boy. Or some shit. Also, that that tobacco can is from George Flowers' pipe tobacco, I'm pretty sure. I've been, dip- I've been dipping my pipe in that for the past 30 years. Okay. All right. There you go. It all, it all comes back. <laughs> Like a Swiss watch. <laughs> she cans it up and just sticks it on a curb. She just leaves it in front of the mall. Oh, you know what I really love is at the very end, he's like, hey, you in the front row. Uh, you know, you want to wish? Like, he's talking, literally talking to the audience to have someone get up in the middle of the movie and let him out. Yeah. I mean, that's how self-aware. For the three people that saw this in the theater. The three people that saw it in the theater. Yeah, that, that's that, that's the kind of joke that doesn't work when, when it goes to home video, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
And it's it's like that thing too where it's like I wonder if uh, David D. Coteau was like, all right, we're gonna make a sequel. The cops are gonna come. They're gonna want a fucking couple of cigarettes. They're gonna pop this baby open, and this thing's gonna be out in the wild. In fact, it's gonna go to McDonald's and it's gonna order some breakfast sandwiches. It's gonna get a McRib, some fries, chocolate milkshake. So that so this film ends and they ride off into the sunset, or in this case, around the building into the dawn, I guess, and then credits in a mo- on a motorcycle. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess Lenny is going to have sex with Calvin because she thinks these dorks are hot or whatever. He's also, like, ready to just hang out while the cops get there. He's like, yeah, what's the big deal? She's like, you want to explain eight mutilated bodies? He's like, all right, maybe you got a point. It was an imp. So it's funny you brought up the sequel because, um... (laughs) The proposed sequel? Well, Sorority Babes and the Slimeball Bolorama 2 is being worked on apparently right now, and it's being directed by Brink Stevens and David DiCato for, for, for Full Moon. Yeah. Wow. Why? Why? Uh, I don't know. I mean, why not? I mean, <laughs> Hopefully more people see this one. I mean, there's a Hobgoblins 2, so all bets are off. Yeah. There is? Yeah, there is. 2009. Oh, shit. Well, Connor, now you know what you're doing this weekend. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> as much as I've been uh, uh, capping on this movie for the past four years or however long we've been talking, I I, I would be in Sorority Babes in the Slime Ball Bolorama 2 in a hot second. 100%. Sign me up. Let me get that imp uh, a special effects job, please. I, I just hope they can get Michael Sanye to do the imp again. I wonder if that will come, come to fruition. That would be amazing. Shoot him a message. You're friends with him on Facebook. You can get the inside scoop. That's true. He'd be like, hey, remember that review you left me? What do you, what do you say? <laughs> <laughs> but uh but yeah so every episode uh we like to do a you know is this on the shelf or is this in the dumpster uh so uh where are we putting this fellas without malice dumpster this is not a really a movie for me uh although talking about it with uh with lobo's kind of inside on it and just having discussion kind of made me dislike it less but i have a very short battery for movies like this with a you know a a tiny thing in a puppet that they kind of have to film around, and a lot of this is very uneventful. And um, I have, uh, I, like, I can't sit still for too long without being like totally engaged. And this movie loses me way too often, um, so I, I, I have to put it in the dumpster. But I don't, but I'm not stuffing it down there like I would with like a Pluto Nash or a fucking Mortal Kombat Annihilation or something like that. It's just really not my kind of movie. And like, but what you said earlier about how all these movies are labors of love, like. I went into it. I went into the like the recording of this, kind of thinking like, you know, it, th- there is something for everybody out there, but it may not be for you when you find it, um, and that's totally fine. Like, if there's an audience for this movie, I don't have any ill will towards them. It's like, you know, I I know other people may feel differently, but you know, if you if you like this kind of thing, more power to you. But it's totally not for me, and that's really all I have to say about it. Yeah, you know, I, I'm you you guys know my affinity for small creature movies, and you know this is kind of no different. It's definitely not in my top five uh, little creature movies, but I do enjoy that. <laughs> it might be in the top ten, though. It it might be in the top ten, but I do enjoy this flick. Um, there's something weird about it. Uh, it, it's it's like trying to be. It, it doesn't know what it wants to be. Is it a horror comedy? Is it a teen sex comedy? Is it a horror movie? You know, is it a little rubber monster film? I, it kind of does all of those things, but never really nails any of them. Um, it's fun to see Hal Havens and Linnea Quigley in it, and I think I really liked this film when I was younger, too, because I was like, hey, those are the people from Night of the Demons! I love this shit! Um... And of course, you know, there you know, when you're a kid, you know, there's boobs in it, there's a little monster in it, uh, even a little bit of gore, um and uh that that sweet that sweet uh eighties music that's probably not the best, but here it, you in know, the I, darkness. <laughs> here in the darkness, baby. <laughs> but um this is uh you know, I, I would this is one of those movies that I put on uh if I'm if I don't know what else to put on, this is this is what I throw in because I'm like, oh shit, I'm gonna put on sorority babes. And and to Lobo's point before, you know, he only remembers the first half of it. It's because that's usually the only part, mostly what I get through before I fall asleep or you know whatever. <laughs> I, it's on the shelf, and because it's on the shelf, uh, or the reason that it's on the shelf is just because it has all my favorite hallmarks. Um, and I, I, can, I can never say no to a Little Rubber Monster movie or a Linnea Quigley movie or a Hell Havens movie and uh, or David D. Coteau for, for that matter. Um, so, yeah, shelf. 
Uh, I totally can say no to all of that. Uh, <laughs> you know, I did, you know, I said earlier in the episode that I had a good time watching this. Uh, so I won't say I hated it, but will I ever watch it again? Probably not, unless it's at the Mahoning Drive-In and that's what they're showing. Yeah, Ghoulies 3 is a better teen sorority comedy than this is, for sure. Oh, that sounds like a bad situation, put it that way. <laughs> uh, Ghoulies 1 and 2, I got opinions about them, but that's a different topic for a different... Go watch that uh, Ghoulies 2 watch-along we just did, if you're on Patreon, if you're on the 5 or $10 tier, to hear what I have to say about that. Uh, but yeah, this is in the dumpster without a doubt. You know, Connor, appreciate you being a little kind to this thing. Uh, cause it did sound like you were struggling through it a little bit, but, uh, you know, I'm going to take that goddamn bowling trophy, uh, take a big old nasty McDonald's, uh, post shit inside of it and just, wow. you just, just slam dunk this motherfucker deep into the dumpster. You know, it's, it's, it's maybe like a foot off the bottom. It's not quite at the bottom. It's not that bad. Dig a dump on that trophy. Well, I, you know, I fill it full of shit. Now the imp's got to deal with that in there too. I'm sure he's really unhappy uh. and uh you know maybe maybe he gets some french fries in there to satiate himself uh you know he's got to clean off the corn and the uh the diarrhea but you know it's something uh i don't know i don't know what i was really expecting to be honest this is uh like you said joe not quite empire but charles band's fucking name is still on it so i wasn't really uh expecting much and uh it's kind of what we got. I love the image of you running up to a dumpster with this movie in your hand and just go like, and just violently. <laughs> well, it's not the it's not the movie. It's the it's the bowling trophy full with my feces that I you know I probably just sat down and emptied my anal cavity right in front of the dumpster. <laughs> I Im I imagine him pulling up his pants and running to the dumpster at the same time <laughs> and holding it under his arm. Yeah, yeah, exactly, <laughs> all in one motion. My goodness, uh, Mr. Lobo. I have to say, you know, the thing is, is that. We like to say they're not bad movies, just misunderstood. And that is definitely the ethic that I come with. That is the, the uh, you know, what's beyond so bad, it's good. You know, um, we've had a whole generation of, of people who, who have a very narrow view of what a movie is. When I listen to a critique of a movie, like if I hear hearing your opinions, whether you liked it or spiked it, whether you put it up on your shelf or you jumped it in the dumpster, your comments tell me everything about you, but not much about this movie. And that's the truth of any criticism. The criticism always tells you everything about the reviewer and nothing about the movie. Um, I, I, I honestly feel like you know, a movie is just, it's light and it's sound, <laughs> and it's, it's pictures, <laughs> it's a dream that we all share together. This was someone's dream that someone had, you know, and some dreams are nightmares and some dreams don't make any sense and some dreams are not budgeted properly and some dreams are made under duress. Um, but I, I have to say that, you know, um, you know, I like what this movie represents, you know, um, there was so much, uh, you know, there was a fever there to make something that, you know, wasn't really any specific genre other than FX. I mean, that was really the genre everyone was trying to do. Everyone was trying to make effects movies because practical effects were, uh, uh, it was like when practical effects hit hard, which is basically the seventies and the eighties. Um, it was like music that no one had ever heard before. You know, it was the next revolution. And there was all these young film, you know, it used to be filmmaking used to be an old person's game. You know, film directors were old guys with, you know, uh, jodhpurs and, and, and megaphones, you know? Yeah. And, and, and eyepieces. And, and from the seventies forward, they were guys that were, you know, they, they were in the seventies, they were in their thirties and by the eighties, they were in their twenties. And so we really got a lot of, uh, young voices trying to, um, satiate, you know, not necessarily what's, you know, uh, proper or what's, uh, <laughs> what people's parents want. Uh, but, but, but basically just trying to feed the need of the youth culture of that time. And, um, uh, you know, uh, again, you know, in this movie, we, we, we do get 
a, a lot of imagination and, you know, everything from the Bride of Frankenstein to uh, King Solomon and gins and genies. Yeah, <laughs> just slipped in there. And 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 uh, so there's there's you know, there's you know, even though there's all these uh, well-worn cliches, there is this kind of defiant. Well, we're not going to just follow all the rules. We're going to do all this stuff because we want to. We might not get another chance to make a movie. This might be it. You know, we might be washing cars, you know, two months from now. You know, so maybe let's just try and make this. And I think that, you know, when you watch a movie, it all depends on your experience and what that movie means to you. I, I you know, I have fond memories of, of finding this movie on cable. I have fond, 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 fond memories of finding that DVD at Big Lots. <laughs> yeah. And now I have a fond memory of sharing this ridiculous movie with you fine gentlemen. So I would certainly put it up, not just on my shelf, but perhaps in my bowling trophy case. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and, you know, we always say this on the show, but I, you know, I don't always like to say it every episode because I feel like the longtime listeners are like, all right, yeah, we get it. Just watch it and judge it for yourself. But, I mean, at the end of the day, like you kind of just said, uh, Lobo, it's it's just our opinion. And at the end of the day, like, everyone's going to have a different takeaway from every movie. And uh, we always just say, you know, check it out. I just, I, I feel like I've been beating that fucking drum a lot lately, so I was trying not to go into that whole tangent, and here I am going into it. It's an, it's an important one. There's a philosophy I've always held, which is that I think it's a miracle that any movie gets made to begin with because of how much work it takes. Yes. Work <laughs> and time and, and like, just, yeah, how much the, the fucking workload I think lots of people really miss, like, uh, underestimate and misunderstand. Yes, absolutely, 100%. And so, like, to me... I think any movie that sees its way to completion, like this one does, should at least have a baseline appreciation, and respect for the, the like just the the labor and the toll and like like Lobo said, it's someone's dreams. Like there, people worked hard on this, which is why I didn't really, I wasn't interested in being like fuck this movie. I didn't enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> well, but I don't want to say that because it's it. I feel like it is kind of like demeaning to the process, which is kind of what I, it's just the thing I've always held to. It's like yeah, I mean it. it I may say it sucks, but like, well, and you guys are entertaining too. And the people who listen to your show, they're, they're expecting to be entertained and certainly exaggerated conflict between you and the movie is always going to be more entertaining than just saying, yeah, I guess it's okay. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. And that's kind of the thing. Go listen to Pluto Nash and you'll hear me just, you, you can hear me just dying just a little bit. Yeah. I think we all did a little. Yeah. Well, to Sean's point, I mean, that that's why we, that's why kind of at the end of the show, it's like that, Hey, you know, you pull up a chair and like put your arm on it and be like, hey, you know, <laughs> like Captain America. Like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so you made fun of this movie, right? Well, yeah, we well, we did. But, you know, all of those all of that appreciation is still there for the filmmakers and how much hard work they put into it. And a lot of time we do kind of break it down. We have fun with it. We poke holes in it. We, you know, we have we have some laughs. We have some jokes. But at the end of the day, I mean, we choose these movies because we like them. You know what I mean? We we don't choose them to be like, oh, we're going to shit on it for an hour and a half. You know what I mean? Uh, Mortal, Mortal Kombat Annihilation begs to differ. Well, and I and I did suggest this movie, so I feel partially responsible in this particular case. <laughs> Not at all. I, I, you. I wouldn't say I love this movie, but I do like it a lot. I said I watch, I've watched this movie quite a bit. It's definitely a movie that I feel like I've heard of for years but never watched, and I... I have to imagine people listening are in the same boat or maybe never heard of it. And it has such a like it has it also has a rich history behind it, too. You know what I mean? Like with who is involved and how they got there. You know, I think the title of this movie is also like uh, provocative enough for someone to be like, you watched what? (laughs) Yeah. And it's and and, uh, lest we forget, I mean, they were trying to make a buck. You know what I mean? (laughs) Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, unfortunately, movies in this country are all products of industry yes very few films are made are made uh, as a creative endeavor uh you nailed it before if this was a if this was a 22 minute monsters episode my goodness you <laughs> it probably i'd be, I'd, i would you'd be a standing ovation right <laughs> yeah straight up <laughs> yeah no i i would be i would be much softer on it if it was like a short film because then i'm like oh you know whatever yeah whatever it's because also like there's, there's a time investment yeah oh you remember the episode with the imp and the bowling trophy yeah it's great <laughs> <laughs> I, I again if you cut if you cut 20 minutes out of this movie 30 minutes uh 
I, I, I would, I would like it even more. You know what I mean? And that, and that's not a. I feel like they had a good, they had some good ideas, but they just like they had to pad it out. You know what I mean? The worst films of all time are not worth making witty commentary about. No. I always make, I always say the same thing. The worst films of all time is some disease of the week Meredith Baxter Bernie movie for a Lifetime or some Ashton Kutcher romantic comedy from ten years ago that no one remembers the name of. <laughs> yeah, it's true. <laughs> Those are the worst movies of all time because we can't even think of them. Like in our memory, they don't even resonate enough to bring back up. Well, th- those movies, I think, are also just copies of copies of copies of copies of copies, which is like you you mentioned before, of like a parody of a parody of a parody. But like, I think in on the the end of what you're talking about, it's like there's you're you're copying a soulless thing and then by the end of it like you know after so many imitations it's just like what is even there yeah for sure and i, and I think that and, and particularly in this case this these movies are somewhat self-aware like you know again it's like okay you know th- these are the kind of movies we have to make and this is the kind of these are the deliverables that we're sort of chained to but we don't have to take ourselves seriously and we can kind of poke fun of this convention the conventions of this um, I think that they, I think, again, I think these movies are making fun of themselves. I don't, I don't think that these movies are, you know, I, I don't think you've got the case of like a Tommy Wiseau situation where you've got someone who thinks they're making Tennessee Williams and they think they're making a serious <laughs> movie and that they, they're expect, they're fully ready to have a tantrum if they don't win the Oscar that year. Correct. You know, it, it, also just to the point of like what they accomplished with the budget that they had to like, I, again, I mentioned in the beginning with the, with the imp puppet and stuff like that is no small feat, especially for one person to sculpt it, mold it, uh, create the, 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 the under skull, create the mechanics for it to create the outer skin for it, to make the eyes and the mouth move and everything. And, and, you know, you're like, oh, that's a stupid little static puppet thing that moves only a little bit, but like. It's a ton of work still. So like I can t- It's a lot of work. And even hobgoblins, which those creatures are really cheap. Yeah. Oh, they're 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 basically just plushies. They make the imp look like Yoda, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and and the thing is is that in talking to Rick in in, in 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 doing this deal with hobgoblins, it's like Rick said that we couldn't afford the latex to make them fully um to make them fully out of latex. So we introduced the fur you know, aspects to them to make it make them cheaper to build. Now, you know, it was say what you want about Hobgoblins, which is a movie with the exact same plot, other except it's a warehouse instead of a, a bowling alley and and and, and a, and a uh, warehouse security guard instead of a janitor. But you still have your teenagers having their wishes come true and and they're being kind of um, uh, in these weird fantasies that can kill them. Yeah. Uh, uh, it, the thing is, is that. Hop Goblins was made for fifteen thousand dollars. You can't even buy a car with fifteen thousand dollars. You know, not even then you couldn't buy a car for fifteen thousand dollars. So just the fact that they were able to b- bring a, a, something on film again. You know, you know, even those credits at the beginning, those pink uh, p- pink credits that, uh, that are at the beginning of these movies, are real simple credits. I mean, those were opticals. They had to like have a li- they had to have someone make those for them, and they had to like they like to have, probably they probably had either transfer lettering or or perhaps made some sort of codaliths that were animated and backlit or however they did it. But they, it, all of that stuff had to be practically made. And, you know, there wasn't just like, OK, let me look at my 5000 fonts in Photoshop. OK, that's what I want. You know, there was whole studio houses just for credits then. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and so, you know, again, the, the the most simple aspects of this, you know, the color correction and and the, um, you know, just, just, you know, did the, you know, with, especially with so much of it being shot in the dark, how much of it just didn't even turn out, you know, where they, they, they just couldn't use shots at all because they just, you know, did, didn't expose properly. You know, there's a certain amount of technical acumen that has to exist to, to make a film at this level that, that is distributable. And, you know, nowadays those tools are so so uh, available and and inexpensive that we just can't appreciate the fact that to come to this level 90 percent of all projects don't come did do do not make it to that level of being completed because they just ran out of money and there just wasn't any more money to pay the editor or to pay the lab to develop the film or what have you yeah absolutely yeah kevin smith says it like filmmaking now is so democratized that like basically anybody can do it but yeah, you're right. Getting to that, getting to that completion point, getting something distributed is a real hurdle. Well, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of 
<laughs> there's a lot of facets to still making films even today. I mean, even if you have the the camera and the and the uh, editing software and and you have some type of you know uh, effects uh, background or whatever, like it's still hard <laughs> to even put something half as good as this together. Um, and like Lobo said, marketable. I mean, d- or does it just go? You know, it goes to you know Amazon Prime for ninety nine cents to die. You know what I mean? Yeah. If if you're lucky, because uh, Amazon Prime uh, uh, turns down a lot of those movies then it goes to tubi and, then goes- <laughs> <laughs> and they just take your movie how do i get on tubi i, I want to get my <laughs> stuff on tubi i can't even get my stuff on tubi lobo i'm shocked you're not on tubi because like literally everything in the world is on tubi <laughs> I don't know what I don't know what I'm doing wrong. I mean, we had we had four we we submitted a bunch of our episodes to Amazon uh, Prime. Uh, Nineteen of them, okay, all of them are in Amazon Prime UK. We had only four that were approved here in the United States, and then they took they took like two or three of them away out of Amazon Prime. So I think that like the only one that's I think only one of the episodes that we submitted is still on Amazon Prime now. It's like I don't understand like. Who are the gatekeepers of all of this stuff? It doesn't make any sense to me. Like it's just one rat just in like a room, just like hitting one or the other button, right? Yeah. It's it's my it's it's actually my it's Eobard. He just runs across the room and hits a button. <laughs> <laughs> but Mr. Lobo, yes. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I from the bottom of our hearts, uh, for coming to hang out with us and, and shoot the shit about uh sorority babes in the slime ball bolorama. Um, where can everybody find your wonderful programs? Well, thank you so much. It was sticky, but fun. <laughs> like a lot of things in life. Wipe wipe your shoes before you yeah. Yeah, you'll track whatever this is into your house and you don't want that. Yeah, I may have I may have to. I'm I'm just gonna leave my shoes outside, honestly. <laughs> Smart idea. <laughs> well, uh, again, uh, Cinema Insomnia, uh, you can find, uh, I guess there's that one Amazon, uh, one episode that might still be on Amazon. <laughs> but there's also, uh, I guess, if you have a Roku or Roku, Roku enabled television or a Roku device, you can watch OSI 74, which is a whole, I mean, it's a whole channel. We've got like maybe over a thousand videos on there, various types, including uh, about a hundred or so episodes of Cinema Insomnia. And, uh, you know, YouTube again, uh, you can, there's Cinema Insomnia on YouTube. Uh, there's 22, uh, releases on, at, from oldie, at oldies.com from Alpha Video DVD. Um, and, and those DVDs, I think, are also like in most of the retail, like if you went to target.com or walmart.com, I think you could probably get any of the DVDs from the online versions of most uh, stores. But uh, yeah, so we have 22 episodes on DVD. We've got uh, a whole Roku channel for you. Uh, we have a whole website which duplicates the channel. So if you don't have a Roku, you can just sort of navigate the osi74.com and watch shows on there. Um, I've got a podcast, Sleepless Nights of uh, Sleepless Nights of Insomnia, or Sleepless Nights with Mr. Lobo, uh, and uh, and on and on. I, I, I'm at RetroCon. I'm at Monster Bash. I'm at Monster Fest. I'm at whatever you name it. I, I it's just just wait. I'll come knocking at your door. <laughs> <laughs> don't look i'll bring it to you <laughs> when you least expect it yeah I just, like i'm expecting to open a curtain and just you're out there in your fucking suit like <laughs> <laughs> you know when you op- you know when you open up uh y- your closet door and you see that pair of shoes behind the behind the uh y- your coats your old coats that's lobo <laughs> actually i imagine like Be- beetlejuice i open up my closet to look for something and there you are holding like a bunch of dvds and i'm like oh my favorite sweatshirt yeah. <laughs> and just push you aside <laughs> <laughs> Except I'm not wearing my shoes because I left them outside because of you guys. Oh, that's right. That's how you snuck in. You're just wearing socks. My nerd socks. Those are my bare feet slippers, yeah. Head over to that Patreon. You can check out that uh, that Ghoulies Watch Along replay. Uh, Five or ten dollar tiers. Get yourself some MD swag. We have one more uh, Empire Pictures watch along that we're going to be doing. Our secret watch along. Um, if you're on that Patreon, you're going to know what it is. Um, and if you if you haven't seen it yet, go back and watch it. There's, there's there might be one, maybe there's two on there. Who knows? But yeah, for no money at all, please do us a big favor. Head over to that Apple Podcast or wherever you get your podcasts and leave us that five star review, please, because that is that's even a bigger help than than you could possibly do anywhere else. Because um, it gets us out of the bottom of the dumpster into more eardrums, like Sean always says, and um, and it helps the show, helps grow the show. Yeah, you don't want to be in the dumpster uh, in, in this particular instance with a uh, bowling trophy full of shit you got to get out of there you got to review the show you know get out of there quick no no yeah you want to get up out of there 
Although I am, I am going to start a new podcast called Bowling Trophy Full of Shit <laughs> oh. and start competing with you guys. Wait a second. Do we get the rights to that? Fred, Fred, Fred Olin Reyes already has the rights. <laughs> <laughs> he filed the paperwork while we were recording the episode. <laughs> He's been behind you the whole time, hasn't he? He's just sitting there writing shit down. He's like, I oh, got it, yep. So that's it. That's Sorority Babes in the Slime Ball Bolorama from 1988, directed by David D. Coteau. If you want some more good, bad, and god-awful movie goodness, head over to moviedumpsterpodcast.com and follow us on all of your favorite social media and streaming platforms. You can also head on over to our Patreon page and sign up for the 2 5 or $10 tiers for monthly exclusive content, or drop by our merch store and grab yourself uh, some non-committal swag. Yeah, and for no money at all, you can leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts to support your favorite show. I'm Joel Escola. I'm Sean O'Rourke. I'm Connor McGraw. I'm Mr. Lobo. Thanks for visiting the dumpster.